powered from the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Red Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the HF Barcelona Studios in U.S. Texas. Welcome to Primetime Special Edition number 90. Tonight, we wrap up 2020 as we welcome two very special guests, Carlito Fuente and Jose Blanco. And as always, Primetime Special Edition is sponsored by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal. The Perdomo 20th anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is the top sellers in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th anniversary blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming liner and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigars is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed for grand brands include the Perdomo Estate Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double Age 12 Year Vintage, Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary, the Perdomo Abano Bourbon Barrel Age, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Aganorsa Leaf. Great leaf makes great cigars. Aganorsa Leaf stands out because of the distinctive flavor of Acorojo 99 and Criollo 98 seeds cultivated by Cuban agronomists on the best lands of Jalapa and Esteli, Nicaragua. When you smoke one of our JFR, JFR Lunatic, Guardian and Farmer, Casa Fernandez cigars, you experience a unique taste and aroma that makes Aganorsa Leaf special. Smoke one today and enjoy the signature flavor of Aganorsa Leaf. And finally, by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app via mobile device. Keep up with everything going on, Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. It's available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming for the Primetime Network of Shows is sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate, as well as the California Studios for the Thursday Primetime Show. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Special Edition number 90. Today wow. is... December, boy, December, <laughs> December 15th. <laughs> I'm losing my, my, my days. Right. December 15th, 2020. It's Will Cooper here. I'm on the red stage here in the Perdomo Cigar Studios here in North Carolina. Joined cross country by my friend and colleague, Mr. Bear Duplissy. Oh, good evening, Coop. Hey, you got the color of the studio right, so. It's... Yeah, that, that helps. I got the day wrong, though. I'm thinking it was a <laughs> tense for some reason, right? I'm like, man, it's, but it's 10 days for Christmas. So uh, I kind of... Uh, yeah, so kind of, uh, you know, one of those things. Uh, we got a great audience here tonight. You yes. know, Bear, I'm, before we kind of get into things, right, you know, first I want to just let the audience, we, for folks who may have seen earlier, we, we had Liana Fuente scheduled for today. Uh, Liana uh, could not make it, unfortunately. We are going to be rescheduling Liana in January, so stay tuned for that. Um, and, you know, uh, we appreciate her flexibility with scheduling as well. Um, but we have, Bear, we have, you know, in baseball, something called the pinch hitter. Yeah, I've heard of it. I've heard the term. So here's the question, but before we this, <laughs> is this the greatest pinch hitting duo ever in the history of a cigar podcast that we're gonna have on? Look, this this, this is this beats Kurt Gibson <laughs> this like beat. tenfold. This this is the ultimate pinch hit of all time. Right. Like I like it is absolutely it, it it's historical. And uh and yeah, I mean if uh, yeah, Kirk Gibson. I uh, Kirk Gibson. I think is a perfect metaphor, right? Right. You know, except for except for ten times better than that. It'd be like Babe Ruth pinching, pinch hinting. So. Well, it was. I was thinking like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, and one is the pinch runner and one's the pinch hitter. I mean, that, that's kind of how yeah. I was looking at this. This this. Yes. I'm Lou Gehrig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. I was the Iron Man. <laughs> Willie Iron Man. Mays. Willie Mays. Willie Mays. <laughs> there you go. Two greats. And uh, yeah, so why don't we introduce them there right off the gate? Because uh, they were very generous to make some time tonight. We have uh, the one and only uh, both are returning uh, on one form or another to primetime shows. But this time making the Tuesday debut, we have Carlos Colito Fuente and Jose Blanco of Arturo Fuente Cigar Company. Gentlemen, thank you so much and welcome to primetime special edition. Thank you, Coop. Thank you very much. Bear, thank you. It's a real privilege to be here. Uh, first of all, on behalf of my daughter, Liana, I, I apologize that she's not here. She was really looking forward to this. And I probably more than her to hear her interview. It's, it's a great privilege to be interviewed on this wonderful and, you know, this show that brings so much information. And it brings the, it brings the unknown out of uh, the guest that's being interviewed. 
I mean, it's really done very well. And I was really looking forward to learning a lot of new things from my daughter. And sadly, she had an emergency that uh, an emergency with her grandfather. And uh, unfortunately, she had to take care of, of her grandfather and so forth. So, so the professor is on, Jose and myself, and I'm looking forward to a beautiful night as always. Usually I'm on this side of the tube watching other people being interviewed, which I enjoy very much. But uh, it's a real pleasure to be back. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, it's uh, yeah. it's uh, it's three a.m. here. Well, now really it's three thirty a.m. Uh, so it's only two hours away from my regular ritual of uh, getting up and feeding the ducks. And Carlito calls me, texts me at four and five o'clock in the morning. Are you up, old man? Have you fed the ducks? <laughs> what am I gonna do? You know but what? Anyway. I've, I've kind of gotten of uh, affection for those ducks. You know, he sends me pictures. To show me when I'm locked down in Dominican Republic that he's feeding ducks in this beautiful pond in, in Europe and everything with these swans and all that. So I got an affection for him. So I really worry about him that he gets, he, you know, he oversleeps or something. Those ducks are waiting for him because it's a ritual for Jose. He drinks his coffee at five in the morning and lights up his first cigar. And then he goes out, takes the fresh air and feeds the ducks. I think that's where he gets all his incredible creativity and ideas. I think the ducks are talking to him. He comes out with some big winners, I tell you. Yeah, no, it's a... It's but a, anyway, yeah. listen, it's a, it's a pleasure for me and Carlito. Uh, we feel sorry for Leon, it's true. Uh, I already uh, had my alarm set up for uh, 3 a.m. to hear her. But, you know, it is what it is. We just wish that uh, Abuelo gets better. And Carlito are here to uh, just to do our... We'll try to do our best, at, you know, at... Carlito at 85 and me at 87, you know, it's, you just got to be patient with us. <laughs> you know, so I think this, this brings ahead. about an important question though. Okay. So Jose, you have you, how long have you been doing the cigar in the morning at five o'clock? Well, to be honest, sometimes at five, today's at three, somebody see me on the airports, you know, taking a picture at three o'clock in the, in the morning or four o'clock is how the hell can you smoke X, Y, Z cigar? And I says, well, I have to have coffee, at least a little toast on it. But right now, to be honest, it's around 6, 6.30. Like Carlito says, I get up, go to the bathroom, make my coffee, make my toast, a little bit of ham, a little bit of cheese, get on the balcony. If it's too cold, I, now it's cold now. I put on a coat. It's just a ritual that I have for many, many years. And to be honest, and Carlito can elaborate on this, and I've told people this, to me, in my personal opinion, the best cigar of the day is the first cigar of the day. It doesn't matter if it's six o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock at night. Your palate is totally fresh and uh, you're not dealing with anything. So to me, and I mean, with this, I'm not telling anybody to get up and feed chickens if they have them in their house and uh, drink coffee. But to me personally, I think the best cigar of the day is that a more early morning smoke, six, six thirty, seven, whatever. But maybe Carlito has a different view on this one. No, not not this time, Professor. No, I definitely agree. But I think it's more than just you have a fresh palate and everything. I think there's there's a ritual. There's something about you know enjoying a cigar. You know, just get your day going, your thoughts together. And it reminds me of that Maxwell House coffee commercial when it's percolating. I used to watch that growing up all the time, you know, the cigar just gets you going and, and I just, it, it seems like it just, it's like, it's like putting some high octane in your body and you just get focused. You enjoy it and you look forward to the day. I think first cigar of the day definitely is probably the most enjoyable one or the one that you really sense that, that you could, that you could really distinguish all the different nuances and everything in the cigar. What's what time? So what time is that for you, Carly? Does it, so Jose starts five, six o'clock in the morning. Are you about the same, or do you? Well, it, wait a little it, bit longer. Actually, I'm not as old as Jose, so he <laughs> he has he has more trouble sleeping. He gets up earlier than I do. But uh, no, usually my first cigar of the day is I to be totally honest. When I get to the factory, it's when I get to the factory. It could be depending. Now it's different because I've been locked down, and uh, here in Santiago we have an incredible team. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going through the warehouses and the and inside the factory as much as I was and so forth. So they protect me a lot. They're concerned about be, me being exposed so much because of my age. So 
I might get to the factory at nine o'clock or something at 930. Uh, I drink already about three coffees before I get there. And then the minute I arrive in the coffee, our master blender or my my right hand or one of the master blenders, but the uh, I want to say the old master Juan Sosa, Juan Sosa is waiting for me with that double espresso and a sample cigar for me to smoke that he wants me to try or something. And that's the first cigar in the morning we start speaking. So it, it's for, it's all relative, but it's only a couple of hours after I wake up. That's beautiful. So, awesome. So that's an interesting question though, because you spend your days in the factory, Carlito, and we all know what that process. Well, not firsthand what that process is like, but we know that you're constantly testing out and smoking things, and and you know you're you're not savoring the cigar like we're savoring the cigar tonight, the four of us, or in Jose's case, the morning. Um, when would you say is your your first full cigar of the day? Is it after? Is it after you're able to? close down the day, you know, with maybe family or friends at the end of the night and you're able to smoke like a full cigar or is it sometime earlier than that? Bear, there is no such thing for me to consistently be able to enjoy a full cigar, to be totally honest. Uh, I get to the factory, the cigar is really good, but I have to walk to the back and go into the rolling room or something. I put the cigar down on the, in the ashtray, put my mask on, my protection, go through the factory and everything, because we're not because to to enjoy a cigar, you can't have your protection, your mask, yeah. which I always have with me, and uh, you know, trying to protect the people as much as possible. So I have to set an example. So I take my mask off. So I put the cigar down. Many times I go back and relight it, but sometimes there's another situation arises that they want me to try something or I see something that I just want to see. I'm curious about uh, cigar making something or I see. I see a, a, I have a curiosity about the way the bunch is being made. And I want to light it. I'll get that cigar and start smoking. And many times I forget about the cigar that I was tremendously enjoying. And I started enjoying that cigar. So, you know, my world is a little different. It's, it's very seldom unless I'm at the Chateau and I have a group of people by myself that I could really light a cigar. And I spent four hours with the cigar. And usually I, that's the type of, uh, of, cigar lover I am. I could be with a cigar three to four hours. I, I'm enjoying it. And, you know, the shorter it gets, the more I love it and the less I want to put it out. I mean, many times I, if I have a toothpick near me, you know, I, I re, it reminds me of my father. My father always said that when I see my father, they put a toothpick through the, the end of the cigar and he starts, I know that's a hell of a good cigar. And uh, many times that's the situation that I'm really faced with. And that's, that's the reality. I love to say that I could sit down and I, and I do this often that I could sit down and enjoy a cigar for two, three hours, but that's uncommon. That's only special occasions and things like that. But that's not to say that it's accumulative, that if I, if I enjoy 20 partial cigars a day, it's equivalent to enjoying 10 full cigars a day. So it's not that I'm not enjoying myself. I have a great, great job. You oh, know? Absolutely. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, but, but you know, it's but but re, in reality, I'm just not in a place unless I'm in a cigar lounge and I'm talking to people and I really light a cigar and I will smoke the whole cigar and perhaps light another one. But during work in the factory, it's, sometimes it becomes difficult because we're trying so many different cigars. I can imagine. I can Absolutely. imagine. I can imagine. So, Carlito, let's. Uh... You were just on the show last month, right? But something like, and I want to get Jose's take on this too. Something really big happened between now, between that show and now, that I don't think anyone has seen in our lifetimes, at least since following you. You shaved your mustache. Oh, huh. right. Was that the? Fr- I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I did shave my mustache. Uh, I, my mustache was removed. Uh, I had a difficult time for the first two weeks. Because it looked like, you know, uh, it started growing out and it was, it was like white, silver, and I had like all these passions. And so, uh, you know, I, I tried to put a little color on it and my skin started getting a rash, so I couldn't do it directly on the skin. So I had to wait for two weeks so I could get a little Q-tip and just get with the hair color and just start touching the end and just make it look like I have a mustache. Yeah. Because I, I actually wore a mustache since I've been 16 years old. I've never been without a mustache. And it, it was, uh, 
the only the only downside really because i really loved it i love taking it off because it meant so much to me because it was i did it in support for my daughter but but it was more than that i just wanted to i just wanted to to be part of the of this great sacrifice that she was doing which is no comparison with the mustache that's nothing because that grows back as we know but um it, I really enjoyed it and everything, but the only thing that I regret, I think that I need to grow it back, and which I'm trying very hard, not keeping it as thin as possible, so I could control it. At least you could see it, because if I make it any thicker, it's gonna be half empty. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, the thing is that I got so many messages from people, Carlito, don't grow it back. You look younger. <laughs> you look younger without it. Don't grow it back. And that is something that I, I started thinking, should I keep it off and everything? But then I'm afraid I, no one will recognize me. If I don't have my hat and my mustache, you know, then, no, you know, I might lose that, that I feel that's necessary. <laughs> who, who is this guy? <laughs> no, because I always thought growing up and everything, I got to look like a Ricky Ricardo, you know, when I was a young man, because I was one of the youngest people in the cigar industry. And, uh, you know, to, to really be able to, for people to think you were a cigar maker, you had to look like a cigar maker. So I, I, I really looked at Ricky Ricardo from Lucille Ball, you know, the Cuba had to have the, the pointed Italian shoes, you know, and the, you know, the mustache, whatever it is looking, you got to look like a cigar maker. So, but it's been so many years, but the honest truth is that I never see my father without a mustache. And as a young man, I wanted to be so much like my father that by the time I was 16, I was trying to get a mustache mm. going. And then later on, it became part of my father and I with the mustache, and I really never removed it to now. Yeah, my, my father's not shaved his mustache in 50 years, he told me. I mean, he's wow. still, always had wow. it, yeah. He's always had it, yeah. That's the staple. I mean, when he got married, he didn't have the mustache, but he grew it and never shaved it. So, uh, yeah. Um, I shaved. I had one in college. I shaved it, and then I grew a beard once. There's a picture made with a beard, but that's it. Yeah, I've been trading. Well, I'm not. I'm not. Oh. I'm not good at beards because listen, I tried for a long time to get a gold <laughs> teeth because it was cool. Plus, to hide some of this that came on in the last decades of my life, to try to hide some of that. But I don't. Hey, I just. I. I just was. I don't have a, a big beard and everything. So if not, I would have a beard. Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think. I think it's cool when people have a you know full face and. To see it, but that's not it's not me. So at least I try to keep the mustache going. Yeah. Bring the beard back, gentlemen. You could do it. I there believe I believe in both there. of you. Barry, not only that, you. there's so many people now to the pandemic, so many clean faces that I remember. All of a sudden I go, Man, you know what? God gave these guys the most beautiful hair in their face and everything. And I can't grow a gold tea. <laughs> and all the girls tell me, all the young ladies tell me, Carlito, grow a gold tea, you would be sexy with a gold tea, grow a gold, and I can't grow a gold tea, you know. And <laughs> My father in his later years had a goatee and everything. And the people, they, you know, it was nice. But, um, but no, but I, I'll keep the mustache as long as I can. <clears throat> well, talking about mustaches and beard, I don't remember. I think it was maybe in the 80s. I grew a mustache. I look horrible. Then uh, in, in 2016, as a protest for about three or four months, I grew the beard. I remember that. Uh, kind of a beard. Yeah, it was... And Jasper kept saying, Daddy, that's horrible. Daddy, that's horrible. And Emma was, when are you going to take that damn thing off? When are you going to take that damn thing off? It had 107 different colors on it. So then <laughs> one, day, one day I shaved it. But to be honest, when Carlito took off the mustache, it was not only one or two people that said, man, your buddy Carlito, man, he's taking fucking 10 or 15 years off. Why doesn't he leave it? And I said, yeah, look, that's like, that's like take, telling a Batman or Superman, you know, Try it without the cape. It'll, no, it'll, remove, it'll no, never to remove, happen. no, to remove the ears. <laughs> this works. Yeah. Uh, Coop, I'm I'm gonna put it out there. I mean, like when you think about when you think about like the iconic mustaches, right? Seriously, and I'm not just saying this because he's our guest this evening, but I mean, when you think about it, I mean, like you know, Carlito's mustache is right up there with like the Sam Elliott and the Tom Selleck, right? I mean, you just it's like I don't I can't I've never I don't think I've ever seen. Sam Elliott without one. I've seen Tom Selleck without one, and that was weird. Yeah. yeah but you're talking about you're talking about men that have men's mustaches. When you talk about Tom Selleck or Sam Elliott with those mustaches, 
mine, mine's looks like a little spaghetti, you know, like an angel hair. Well, that, that's just that's style. That's just style not, choice, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I wanted to appear like, but it's more than style <laughs> choice. My my uncle my uncle Roy actually had uh he I, I think he's I think he's gone clean shaven for a little bit now but what, for my entire you know my entire childhood and my youth he always had a mustache and when he shaved it it was like the weirdest thing and I was like grow it back and he's like he's like you, uh because I always said that I would never grow a mustache by itself I just I, I just didn't like the way it looked on my face um and he's like but you hate mustaches I was like I hate mustaches on me no it's it's you have to have it. Please grow it back. <laughs> but what a, what a great what a great cause for you to do it for Carlito. And I, I'm, oh, I know you were I know you were honored I know you were honored to do it. Um, you know I know that you were actually the one that took the shears to your to your daughter's hair. What what was it like to you know what was that what was that experience like knowing the sacrifice that she was giving up, uh, the the feat that she was able to do. She wanted to raise forty thousand dollars. She raised over eighty. I mean this was what an I mean. I know you're very proud of your children, but I mean, this had to be a really nice yeah. moment for you. No, it, it truly was a great moment for me and everyone that knows Liana. And it's a great moment also because I saw that through, you know, through difficult times like the pandemic when everyone is having such a hard time, that through social media, to podcasts, to making this information available, so many people came together. And that's the power of, of the programs like yours and and other you know through Facebook and Instagram, because Liana has been raising money maybe fifteen to eighteen years maybe longer, uh, raising money for this cause and she's one of the leaders of Tampa Bay if not the leader. She runs marathons and for the whole month and she's very much involved with the whole organization uh, to raise awareness and looking for a cure for breast cancer, and she you know she. Twenty thousand. It was that was around twenty thousand dollars was the average was she would raise. So this year was very special to her. She says, "I'm going to make a commitment. If I could raise forty thousand, I uh, I would remove all my hair." And my daughter had wavy, curly, beautiful, soft hair. It was just so soft that if you know she, if you pull on it, you know when she didn't blow it out and got it straight or whatever, or she just put gel, it just you pull on it, it just felt like it went to her waist and then it spring up, but it was so soft. I, I knew it was a big sacrifice uh, for her. And, uh, you know, she, once she went public with it, we got support from so many other manufacturers, people, who, you know, lovers of the leaf, both the brothers and the sisters. And it just started growing and growing and growing. And from the 40,000 that she was hoping that, or get close to it, you have a target, you never know if you can make it from past experience. She raised over $85,000, but it's not only the money. It brought a lot of people together, brought a lot of awareness. And uh, it was it was one great accomplishment that really meant a lot to her. Uh, and it meant a lot to so many people. So many people wrote to Liana and, uh, and, and to myself and, and to my sister, Cynthia, saying that they were at the moment going through a very difficult time with a close family member or a wife, or they, they had lost someone recently, and how much this meant to them and so forth. So it really connected with a lot of people. It was more than just something uh, that it became something that that so so many around the world actually uh, really got involved with. So I think that that is what really brought me the most warmth and uh, really appreciation to see the people come together for such a great cause. And yes, it was very difficult to cut her hair, but once I got going, you know, there were people there and it was a camera going. So once you get a camera going, I'm there. So what am I gonna do? You know, I keep, I keep going back and having flashback about all these wrestling events and everything, you know, that I used to go to. And I got those shears and I was just going away. I, I got so excited trying to cut hair that when I got the, whatever, that little machine thing, I forgot to pull, put oil on it. And I was trying to go through, it kept getting stuck and I kept pulling her hair. And then her husband said, wait, enough's enough. You know, he came and says, let me take over. He goes, oh, oh, I, I was, and yeah, I didn't leave. It looked like I did, I did dig a couple of holes in her and everything, but it, it was all in the fun. It really was, it was fun. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great cause. What, you know, the Fuentes have always been around charitable causes. This is a wonderful cause. I'll say I lost both my grandmothers uh, to breast cancer, one before I was born and one when I was very young. So 
uh, and uh, my mom was raised by her mother's sisters after um, after her mom passed away, and both those sisters contracted breast cancer but were able to fight it off. So it, it's it, it's a very yeah this is a very, this is a cause that it, everyone is affected by this with a loved one. Yes. Um, so and it affects it, so many women. It affects so many women. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the leading causes of death and cancer with women, but also affects men. I, I have personal good friends who've had yeah. uh, who've been affected by, you know, breast cancer yeah. and it affects men also that a lot of people are not aware of. Yeah. Oh, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. One in 32 men and one in eight women. Yeah. So. But but this goes back, you know, I, I love my daughter and I'm so proud of her. And, and uh, you know, it, it, I think any father would get involved and encourage his children so much so that she's been doing this for so long that I fell in love with the color pink. I started, I started a couple of years ago. We started with advertisements, you know, with wearing pink shirts and or wearing a pink ribbon and a hat and wearing pink clothes and started, you know, trying to promote this is years ago, you know, real men wear pink and so forth, because I thought not realizing at the time it was, it was for the love of my daughter. But I, but also there was something behind my thought and my way of thinking that was, that was probably beyond that. I, I always felt that, that pink was associated with, with, uh, with being feminine or women and so forth. And, um, I, I thought that, I thought that, man, we, we need to bring the women in on this, you know, bring the women in our industry because I believe so much in the women. I do. I honestly do. I think the greatest thing that's happened in our industry in the last decade, all the women who are enjoying cigars, that are going to the cigar lounges, the women who are in the industry now that, you know, are in the forefront, I think. And I just fell in love with pink and started with my daughter, but pink became much more than the inspiration on pink is Liana. It's Liana. And it's not about women because I made a cigar for human beings. I didn't make a cigar that's going to be to try to please a woman. I made a cigar to try to please someone who enjoys a great cigar because I don't, I don't, I never identify gender with the, with a certain taste or a certain preference. I, I think that that has been more marketing than anything else, my opinion. And uh, it's been just, you know, in a way it's been a, in the old days, it was a taboo if a woman wanted to have a single malt whiskey or bourbon, they had to have ginger ale or something while the men went back to the library and they sat back under smoking jackets and smoked their cigars and talked politics and drank whiskey. The women were in the kitchen and everything. And thank God those days are over. And um, I really believe in that. I do and I'll do whatever I could do to try to, to give women the encouragement and the freedom that they feel that they could join anybody in this world of cigars to enjoy a cigar or have, you know, to be able to be proud that they're part of this world. You know, Carlito and Jose, you both of you, there's a lot of women in your lives who are in the industry and really Carlito, we were going to talk to Leanna about this Fuente. I mean, prominent women in, in the company, you know, you've, you know, both your sister, you, you know, Liana, key roles in this company. I mean, um, that's very, you know, it's, 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 I think really, if you look at that, you guys are, are, are right at the front of that right now. Yeah. But it, it goes, it goes way beyond that. I mean, it was that way with my mother and my grandmother, my grandmother was there with my grandfather rolling cigars with them. And, you know, he would make the bun, she would roll it. You know, she would prepare the paste for the cigar makers. She would select wrappers. It was the same thing. My mother worked with my father. It was just never made public because there was no media to make it public in that generation. We didn't have the opportunity now. There weren't any publications that would make this, uh, that, would, that would bring this to the forefront. It was just a fact. And it was like, like that with many families and you know, and you, you hear our, you know, our dear friend, our colleague, our brother, Ernesto Pérez Carrillo, how he speaks, how Elena was always by his side. You see Lito, uh, you know, Lito with Ines was always by his side. And, and you look at Nick with his wife, you know, how she, I mean, the woman, and, and I'm not going to mention <laughs> Jose, you know, I think he really, he talks about smoking cigars and everything early in the morning. 
I think he wasn't that enthused or involved with cigars until he met his wife. I think she brought him to another level. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make, yeah, because she loves, I mean, she is really into it and she's in the world and from fermentation to cigar making and everything. I think that it's really, if you really look, it's been around for a long time. It just hasn't, hasn't been public. It hasn't been in the forefront. Yeah. And I think that uh, now through, you know, through the media and through everything that's going on, through all these clubs and everything, it's something that is very much accepted and I encourage it. So I, I think it's great. I mean, that's, to me, that's, I look at my son who's 20 years old that I believe is, is the future. I really believe he has such a strong, and I look at him, that lucky son of a, let me say gun, okay, instead of bitch. That lucky kid, man, he's gonna have a world that he's gonna go with all these beautiful women enjoying cigars and this and going to the clubs and all that. And I had to smoke with all those guys that were that were 20, 30 years older than me when I was growing up, you know? So, so I think that the world, that it's just the world of cigars has become fascinating. It totally, it totally has been. Uh, you know, it's uh, talking a little bit about that. It's, uh, I mean, even though Carlito's older than me, uh, we go <laughs> back, uh, but women have always been uh, played a role because, be, like Carlito said, there was no media. But I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, who would do all the sorting, the stripping of, of all the tobacco? Even in some in countries, you would see a, a lot of women picking up. Uh, the leaves and you know uh, doing uh, preparing the kuhe, you know uh, uh, putting them with the needle to, to, to be hanged in there and you know if you look at the last eight or ten years how many women are out there and i gotta tell you something to be honest i know women a lot of them that could define a cigar better than men that have been smoking for 25 or 30 years could take a blend apart and tell you this is this i'm picking up this they retro hill like 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 Carlito or Adam does. I mean, immensely. And I got to tell you something. In my personal opinion, I've sat down in seminars and women have picked up notes that I go to myself, smoke that cigar again with a different mindset and said, shit, God, it's, it's true. It does have notes of this. And I'm not talking about some notes that, you know, some people throw out there that uh, we know it's not there. They just, for the hell of it. Yeah. But women have something totally different. Plus, the handling, if you look at a man, and don't get, uh, get me wrong, you see a man handling uh, a leaf of wrapper, sorting it, and you see a woman, I can guarantee you, what that woman is doing, I don't care how good the guy's hands are, I would say the woman is more delicate, more her hands are more soft and could work stretching out that wrapper or stretching out that binder in a way that a man won't do it. I mean, that's my two cents, Khalid. I don't know what you think. No, you know what? More than that, Jose, I agree totally. I think it's that mother, motherly instinct. Uh, not only that, one thing, I don't, I don't have any scientific data to back it up, but one thing that I discovered from experience and my father made me aware of is that to us, the experience that we have, women have a much better nose for aromas and different scents. I don't know if that's instinctive or that's the motherly instinct in them, that sixth scent. They pick up, a woman could tell of a cigar, they, they, they could tell if they're offended by a certain thing because this raw tobacco in there wasn't fermented properly or the cigar smells nice. How many times have you been out in a park or something and a lady walks by something, oh, that cigar smells nice. You know, cigar smells nice. There's something about that I believe in. And um, we have women in our factory who always have. And, you know, you see the cigar of the year that, you know, the people talk so much about, you know, the shark. That's made by two sisters, they're women. Yes, exactly. There's two sisters, a lot of the cigars, the Lancero's made by a woman. And uh, some of those very delicate cigars and everything, uh, and we don't, we don't train a woman or pick a woman or hire a woman because she's a woman. We, we, we start with human beings where we're trading. Some women excel and some men excel. I think that's more uh, a personal character, human instinct. And then we, we develop those. But there are some women that are as good as it gets. And, uh, you know, we just saw Anna the other day from... Uh, 
from Alano's being, you know, she's a woman, she excelled in, uh, you know, in, in what she does for Alano's and everything. She's a woman and she made so many contributions to that organization. So women are very much involved. You know, we go back to women and going back to pinks, it's a tribute to women, but it's also the gratitude and the love that my family has for women and how grateful we are. Very well said. Very well said. The, uh, you know, the other point I'll make just as long as we're on the topic of women in cigars, I talk about my experience when I was in England a couple years ago and I was in a few of the cigar lounges and the big observation, I saw a lot more women in cigar lounges in England than I do in the U S. Um, and I was, I, I guess I don't, I, I'll admit I was a little astonished. I saw the women smoking fuller and stronger cigars than the men. The men were smoking wow. a lot of Cuban stuff in England, but the women were kind of gravitating to the Nicaraguan and the fuller blends. And it wasn't just like one time. I saw it a lot. Um, so there was like no notion there of a woman's cigar. There. They were smoking the stuff the, the, that you would see here, uh, the Nicaraguan, the, the stronger Nicaraguan blends. So. Wow, interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's unscientific. That's unscientific. That was just an observation, but but it was yeah, more exactly. Place. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but we also see that in the United States. We see that uh, women, uh, you know, and I see it in Instagram. Thanks to Jose that that this dinosaur escaped Jurassic Park, and Jose <laughs> finally forced me to start Instagram, and I'm fascinated by it because I see so many photographs of people, women and men, but. But you just notice the cigars and the women are smoking full body cigars. Yeah. It's not, and it's not a, a what used to be considered a cigar for a woman, you know, a thin long ring gauge or a straw shape or something uh, supposedly mild, you know, sweet. But no, these are, these are real cigars with real taste, yeah. you know, for real, con real connoisseurs and they're enjoying them. And, yeah. Just as just as Jose said, they got incredible palates. They know what they like, and um, it's it's just great to see that. I think all of us are are very are, we're thrilled with this change in the industry, which I think it's been in the last decade or so, and more so in the last five years, and more so this year that we're actually becoming aware because of you know that we're all contained in our homes or in our company, we're not able to travel or go to cigar lounges, but we're seeing it through, through the social media and all the networks. Sure. Wanna, uh, I wanna tell a, a little story about, I was doing an event and I'm not gonna mention the, the store because uh, a lot of guys were embarrassed. So I'm doing a seminar, there was about 26 or 27 guys. This woman comes in, she was, uh, friend on, uh, I think it was Facebook, Instagram, I can't remember, years ago. And everybody's looking at her and some, some I hear some guy saying like, what's this bimbo doing here or this or that, but a bing bang. You know how so men get. So she's there in the seminar and I, you know, Coop has seen it a million times in Bear too. I'm asking all the questions. What are the six elements about this? What's the, why does, the, what's the percentage of the flavor and strength on the ring gauge and all that? Let me tell you something. Those guys didn't know shit. And that woman was bing, bam, bing, bam, bing, bam, bing, bam, bing, bam, bing, bam, bing, bam. And I said to myself two things. Or, or she's seen some of the seminars on YouTube or she uh, talked to somebody. But then after that, she went out and talked to me. And I asked her, uh, I know we've been friends on, on, no, and I remember on Twitter, but I've never really gotten to meet you. And she says, Jose Blanco, you know why I came here? Because I've heard that in this shop, they love to make fun out of men. And I've been smoking for 14 years. I've been to Cuba. I've been to uh, Dominican Republic. I've been to Honduras. I love cigars and I love what you do for the industry. And I just wanted to make a point. Ah, because at the end of the seminar, when I asked, what have you learned after everybody gave their answer? I said, gentlemen, as you all might have noticed, this woman, knows her shit and, and to be honest i guess they were all embarrassed and they all applauded her so good for that they should be embarrassed of course true story yeah that's that, a it does bring about a certain question though carlito i mean i mean i mean you've got a very large family and, and the fuente uh the, you know fuente cigars has always been a family business and everything but the uh, you know 
Liana and all the the time that she put in, you know, I, I heard her recount. I was really excited to talk to her about the story about the year she spent by your father's side and learning from him as well from you and everything. Um, but you're certainly nowhere de- nowhere near being done uh, with your career. But she seems to be the next in line. So I mean, we could see where the next generation of uh, of Fuente leadership that 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 icon at the head of the company is 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 your daughter. I mean that that is. I mean, that has to make you, I know we already talked about how proud you are of your children, but that has to, has to bring a, just a huge smile to your face. Absolutely. And uh, one thing, I guess you call it tough love. Uh, for many, many years, I, you know, I just the way I am and the way my father was with me, been pretty stern and strict with my daughter and many things. And many times she's so excited to show me a project that she has and I go back and fix it. It's not right. You know, I go back and it really is painful to say this because it hurts, but it's the way I was taught, go back and do it, go back and do it. Now she, it's just that I can't give up the ship. <laughs> you know, I just can't get, but she does all the work and she shows it to me. And sometimes I try to find something I have to say just so that I, I'm, I'm needed or wanted, but I'm so proud of her. She's so much like me that she has really assimilated the way I think, the way I was attempting to achieve things, the image that I wanted to project for the family, the emotions that I felt, how do you, how, how do you illustrate it through, through materials, through a web page, and how do you stay loyal to your belief and your philosophy without getting consumed with what everybody else is doing? and following everybody else's footstep. How do you stay loyal to your belief and you see your focus and not get distracted about everything that's happening around you? And uh, she has really developed at her young age and everything that it is amazing. Yes, she is She is a leader. She, she bleeds tobacco. She bleeds the name. She bleeds the brand. It's her life. She's consumed by it. But I also have two other daughters and uh, a son coming up and everything. And my hope is that each of them go in a different direction, no difference than a great team that you have the quarterback, you have the tight end, you got the line and you got every, so they can work together as a team and everything. And each one is, each one have a understanding of the whole, of the whole industry and everything and tobacco, because I think that where Jose is great, for example, that he knows every aspect of the industry from fermentation to growing to tobacco seeds to everything. So when you're on the market and you can speak to people and you know who's saying what's going on, it makes it that much easier. My children have to, just like Liana, she lived in the Dominican Republic. She worked and made cigars. She's made cigars. She was by my father's side. And it gave her that, that fundamental that's so needed. That's the same thing. My son makes cigars since he was very young. And he's been around cigars, but, you know, he's been in education now. He's in Boston studying. But all of them, they, you know, my daughter, Liviana, spent a year and a half in the factory living here. And she's got a, you know, her master's degree from Babson. And very, very, you know, I'm very blessed that I have uh, very capable children. What they end up doing in their life, the only thing I want them to be happy, pursue their happiness in their hearts. And so we'll see. But I really have a lot of faith. And, and the women for the future. And Liana, forget it, that is her life. I mean, she's already proven it. She's already there. Liana is there, she's gonna stay there. And she's always gonna be an anchor and, you know, and be, be the captain of the ship, but she's gonna have support from the family because no one could do this alone. This is uh, grown by leaps and bounds and there's so many facets of the world of cigars that you really, you need to have a strong team. And when you have people that believe the same as you believe, they have the same philosophy. If it's family, hopefully a lot of times, because many times families don't get along and families are the problem or the destruction of, uh, of any of a company that, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things to overcome, but I really believe in the family, keeping the family upset at many times. And um, my only dream of life is for the company to continue for the next hundred years and beyond that. There's nothing more that I want in life. That is my ultimate goal, and it has been since I could remember. 
you know, I have to say something about Liana, even though I remember it had to be maybe 2003, 2004, I was working with Laurora and all of a sudden I see Carlito coming up and he brings Liana uh, to introduce me to her. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about that. And then, you know, through social media, I've uh, followed her career. When I was working with Ernie, I bumped into her. She was always so kind and sweet. But now working these last nine months, almost 10 months, Carlito knows that I talk with her a lot. Uh, she asked me a lot of questions. Uh, tonight I was really, you know, worried about her and uh, I wanted her to feel great. But I got to tell you, I tell Carlito all the time, look, I see her, I see you. She's a firecracker. I know you're hard on her sometimes, but I got to tell you something. You don't find women, not only in the cigar business, overall, that are so passionate. She loves her father so much. Her love for her grandfather. I get emotional sometimes about her grandmother it because, uh, and everybody. Her she grandmother, loved. her her dogs, <laughs> the dogs Gordo. When we were doing yeah. the uh, raising money for Gordo, but Liana has something that I have seen, and I'm not saying this because I know Liana might be uh, hearing this and Carlitos I, there. I don't think so. That she is, she is so passionate. She wants to make her father so proud. And I said, Liana, you make your father proud every single day, what you do, your leadership, your ideas, the passion, what you, what the way that you act is not like the daughter of Carlos Fuente. You act like an, a true employee of the company that is doing the best. So uh, she's amazing. I look forward to work with her. I've told Carlito that uh, I probably will work with the company 10 more years after 80. I'm on a, I'll be on a rocking chair waiting for Carlito to come have coffee with me. But at least for the next eight or 10 years, if I'm healthy, I will be there for her, for all the kids. And uh, to me, she's a sweetheart and uh, all the best. And she's just an amazing person. That's all. Yeah. I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, she is. She is. And uh, I got to say that it's not that easy for me because Liana with her development and her leadership, she's tough on me. <laughs> she is very <laughs> tough on me. She doesn't agree and she calls me, she tells me, and she's <laughs> tough. And many times she convinces me and that's what I want, that I want, you know, convince me. And uh, she's very tough. But Jose, in my defense, I know how close you become, but I told you Jose, I'm tough on my daughter. Give her a call once in a while and smooth it out and everything. And Jose has become like <laughs> that. That, that, you know, that fatherly, you know, I said, Jose, call her up, stay in touch with her, you know, because I've just, you know, I've been hitting her hard and all that. Come back, you know, keep her because she's just so passionate, Will. She is so passionate. She wants, like Jose says, I was the same with my father. She wanted to please me so much and do the right thing. And, and, and if sometimes I have an opinion, I say, well, it's good, but we got to think about it and make it better or we have to wait or something because of this reason or that reason. She gets frustrated because she really wants things to happen. And uh, Jose has has played an incredible role, and in, and that's what I wanted because I know that one of the things I spoke to Jose about is you know it's it's not it's not how much he could travel or visit every tobacconist or every cigar lounge. Jose's value is his experience, his ability to educate, because I really believe in life that you know the greatest asset one could have. In their, in, in their, their point of life where they become statesmen is to be able to educate and pass down your experience to those so it's not lost. Jose and I talk about it so much. You know, we talk about the old days and the people that were there before us, all those great masters and how they're forgotten, how people don't even know their names. And we are what we are today because of what we learn from them. And if history is not documented, somebody's going to create a new history. And that for people like Jose, that's been around a long time myself, it becomes very frustrating when, when we're exposed to that. So we talk about it a lot. So it, I think it's, I think Jose's greatest asset is that he could teach. He loves to teach. He wants to teach. And I'm just blessed to have him on my team so he could be there for my children and anybody else in our organization. You know, the one thing uh, I got to mention also, 
It's Cynthia, your sister, which, you know, I'm her press agent and uh, <laughs> I hook her up with, with, with everything because the other day we were doing the launch in uh, Denmark that was actually the first time that a major company has done a uh, launch of a product in Denmark. And to be honest, you know, everybody was happy to see you, to see Jeremiah, but the compliments for people just seeing uh, Cynthia, like I tell her with that million dollar smile, I mean, it's just out of this world. Cynthia has played a, a very important role. I mean, you have a lot of fans. I have some fans, but I got to tell you something. Uh, Cynthia is not only uh, your sister, but uh, she she uh, she she adds a lot to the company. And now that we're doing all these virtuals and all these shows, you cannot imagine how uh, her fan club has grown a lot. So you got to be careful. She can surpass you. <laughs> I've been careful for the last 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Cynthia's, a, Cynthia's yeah. a ball of love. She's a ball of love. Everybody yeah. loves her. But she, just like Liano, before Liana, Cynthia's so passionate, loves the factory, loves the people, knows everyone in the whole organization. They love when Cynthia comes and she's bringing photos of the family and she's sharing photos with everybody. Cynthia's so hands-on personal. People love her. She just... She's just, she's a wonderful ambassador for the entire industry. She's just great. I think, I think all the Fuentes have that, uh, that, you know, again, not just cause you're, you're, you're sitting across from me, Carlito, but I think, um, you, your sister, your daughter, they, you all have this, 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 this magnetism, this, 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 the thing that draws people into it, whether it's, you know, you know, it's, it's not just what you've brought to the industry. Of course, that's a huge, uh, massive part of it, but I think it's just the way you are with people, the way that you bring them in with the stories of your life, your father's life, your grandfather's life, uh, the, the legacy of everything, you know, to, to speak, uh, what you just a point on what you were talking about with Jose for a moment ago, you know, you, you your experience is, 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 is within this, this, this amazing story that is the Fuente story. You know, Jose's had an incredible journey as well with being a part of and being interwoven in so many different facets. Do you think you were talking about him as a teacher a moment ago? Do you think that that's one of the one of the one of the things you were really excited about with bringing him on board to this team was the fact that he could offer those lessons from so many other places that he's learned along the way? Well, to be honest with you, I was not aware of what Jose could bring to the table and two months after I started working with him, oh, he started, we started working together. Uh, to, I, I know Jose for many years now, 25 years, 30, how long has been Jose? Uh, since, since he was 100. in charge, well, since well, Jose was in public relations or head of president in marketing, president of beer, and we go back and everything. And I remember Jose, not, not a big man, but you know, the, a rec, normal man and, and he was facing these athletes that were, you know, and he would just tell them, this is the way it is. And I don't take no shit from anybody. And this is the way, and he ran everything, which was very, very difficult when people were, you know, at the verge of emotions exploding and everything. Jose had complete control and his company was first. His brand was first. So I don't think it has to do really with cigars. It has to be with Jose's character and how, he, he, his brand was everything. Presidente beer above everything. The athletes came in second. Who won everything was fairness. And these were the characteristics that I started admiring about Jose. We became good friends and we known each other for many years and everything. And, you know, I always saw Jose as a family member of the Leon Jimenez family, which is the most respected, among the most respected families in the Dominican Republic with the longest tradition and cigars and everything. And as a family member, I always had that, we had that personal friendship and that respect, but always had that armed distance of respect towards the Leon family, that there were certain things that were taboo that they're not even questions. We don't talk about this, we don't talk about that. We talked about personal things. And then he was working in, in Nicaragua with a great family, the Cuencas. And you know, I, I, Jose, we run into each other, we were friends. I see he's successful everywhere he goes. And then he was with one of my brothers, which is Ernesto Perez Carrillo and this and that. And 
I was, you know, and we've had dinners together and he and his wife and we go into a restaurant that we get there at 11 o'clock and we leave at nine o'clock at night. It's, I don't know how much we drank or how many cigars we smoked, but we talked about everything under the universe. You and know, the day, one day came where, one day came that Jose came to me, says he was moving back to Europe and everything. And he was no longer working with somebody in the industry. And all of a sudden, things clicked in my mind. I go, wow, Europe, you know, maybe there's something that you could, we could do together. And it wasn't too many months after and speaking to Jose, actually, we were already working together that I started realizing, you know, all the, all the attributes, all the quality, the quality. I knew he knew tobacco. I knew he knew blending because everybody in the industry has seen it. Jose was on YouTube. I knew he was the head of Pro Cigar doing all these tastings. And everybody, I mean, everybody in the industry would say, man, Jose Blanco was the best event. Jose Blanco this. So everybody knew Jose Blanco was. And, but I never worked with him. And it wasn't until we were, that I see him, we started talking, that I realized, wow, this is an added benefit. This man could be, this man could be a mentor for the people that really I need mentorship for. And it, which is my children and the younger people in the, in the industry. I mean, young people in our company. So that's very important to me. And I see that as his greatest asset. The other, the, everything else is a given, you know, everything else. But that to me is very important. Uh, Carly, I, get uh, uh, <clears throat> I gotta, I gotta tell you something. It's true. We've been friends for 30 plus years and we always talked, kept our disses when it came to tobacco out of respect. And uh, even though uh, you would uh, send me always a box of Añejo or I would go to the factory and yeah. I didn't, I didn't want an Opus. I didn't want one of those rare things. It always be a Don Carlos or the Añejo 46. And uh, to me, I've said it many times, it's been a pleasure and honor. I think that, uh, like I said, when we talk, uh, I want to work with uh which I consider, and I'm not, saying, I'm not saying this now, which I consider the uh, best family-owned, prestigious family-owned company in the, in, in the world. But it's not because it's big or it's small. It's because you, your father, your grandfather, your sister, Liana, you have those values the way I was raised also. Be respectful, be kind to people. And like I've said it in many shows, I can name... 10, 20, 30 people that know more about cigars, that know more about tobacco than me. The problem is they're not willing to share. They're not willing to educate. They're not willing to take time just to help people understand why this is the greatest industry in the world. So I can't promise you anything after I'm 80, but uh, we'll work out an an another contract after I'm 80, maybe to 81. Carly, I got to tell you. You're not going uh, anywhere. Go on. Uh, so Sorry, I got to tell you. No, that's okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. I got to tell you this story. So Jose and I talk very frequently. I mean, I think is the, is it would be an understatement, right? This guy's the best poker player in the world because I, you know, I was trying to figure out where he was going next, right? We both were, yeah. We both were, right? And if I tell you I had – this one hit me from left field, right? Um, not that it didn't make sense. It totally, I see the, the fit and, and, and everything. It just, it, it, like I said, Jose didn't give me one inkling on this one is what I'm just going to tell you. He played poker <laughs> with this one. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, I mean, like I said, I think it's a, it, the only bad thing about it, Carlito is we, we lost Jose to the other hemisphere. That's the, that's the downside. That, but, but through the, through technology, Jose and I have been able to talk as frequently as we did when he was in the States. I remember, Jose, I remember those conversations we had when you were in Hoboken and you go down to the river for your smoke. I mean, so it, it, that hasn't changed through technology, which has been really good. Yeah, Coop. And also, I, I like to add that you'll see Jose at the conventions. Uh, Jose will be in Tampa now with me. Well, we're having a, a national sales meeting that's virtual. Jose will be in headquarters with uh, our key people, uh, you know, running his section of the, of the sales presentation and so forth and being involved. And Jose's going to be involved with time and time. Of course, he has his family in Europe. And he needs to be near his family. I want him near his family. I'm happy he's there. And, um, you know, he, he, 
his contributions are huge no matter where he's at. But Jose's not, Jose's going to be around the world. It's, he's going to be wherever he's needed and so forth. And right now, you know, being near his family and everything, there's so much to do in Europe. It's, 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 a relative, it's not a new market for us, but it's a market that it is new in the sense that we were very isolated in Western Europe, so forth. And I, there's something I like to say, if, if I'm, I'm able to, I think to make it clear because I've never been asked this question. So I'm gonna ask myself a question if you allow me to. Absolutely. I think it's information of why and it all started every cigar that you know i'm sure you know and a lot of listeners know we've been so oversold for years and trying to catch up and oversold oversold but when this whole thing came out eight years ago or just when i started with being a board member of the cra we started with cra and then the threats of everything that was taking place then the fda i thought to myself my god my father has worked so hard you know, to build this company and, and there's people that have been with us for 30, 40 years. They're depending on us. I have a foundation that 500 children a year, we've had already 13 graduation classes. They're moving on to universities, children that were looking for work so they could eat that day that weren't in school are now, you know, becoming professional. I have such a responsibility. I really believed, and it was the estimates always told if, if the regulations came through, we're going to lose 30% of our business. This company that has been built with all the people that have given support all these years cannot withstand a loss of 30% of its sales without having to restructure and let a lot of people go and cut down and people who have been dependent on us, who have given their life to us, will have to go somewhere else or lose their jobs. I said, I can't allow that. I can't let that fall on my conscience. So thinking that there was a great possibility because all of the big boys said that it was impossible for us to get any kind of relief, to face it, that this is what's happening. I started traveling to Dubai. I went to Russia. I went to, started traveling for the first time, making presence to be able to get that insurance that if something hit the United States, if the FDA was going to uh, apply its regulations, that we, I would be able to keep the company going until we could find some kind of relief or something. That was the that was the intention of going outside the United States, and we started going and everything. And, and Jose is someone that that could really, I believe, old school. You need that personal contact. You need people going out visiting the smoke shops, uh, visiting the distributors, working with their salesmen. And uh, that's the way we did in the United States. And I believe in that. And Jose moving to Europe, which is a great opportunity to be able to have that kind of communication. So that, that in a nutshell is why all this took place. Uh, so the first time that I actually had the opportunity and privilege of, uh, of interviewing Jose, he was in a humidor at Michael's Tobacco here in Euless, Texas. And uh, we, we started talking about tobacco, uh, which is... Uh, what uh, what Jose and I do and and I asked him what this is at the time I said what's your favorite rapper to work with and he said you know like I he was like well I work with a lot of different rappers but I have to say by the my favorite rapper um, is Cameroon from Africa he was very quick to point out from Africa Cameroon yeah. and he went you know he went into this this poetic diatribe of how just incredible Cameroon tobacco is and that stuck with me, you know, and, and we would always revisit that subject when we would reconnect on a number of occasions. And so when this move transpired, I called him over Facebook Messenger. And the first thing I said, I didn't say hello. I didn't say, hey, Jose. I didn't say anything like that. I said, Cameroon uh, at the top of my lungs. And I was so excited for him um, because, he, you know, that obviously being the centerpiece of some of the incredible work that you do, Carlito, and your family, um, I, I knew he was, I knew he was home and that, that, uh, that brought a smile to my face yeah. uh, over the years that I've known him. You know, it's, uh, I remember that and Carlito knows that because, uh, and maybe a lot of listeners, I knew Heller Melifer, I knew, uh, Rick and I knew Josh and Jeremiah since they were young and Cameroon with a all due respect to all the great rappers that have grown in the world. To me, it's, but Cameroon 
grown in Africa. It's so unique, it's so exotic. It has the characteristics, in my opinion, that no other rapper has. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of great rappers out there. I love Pabano, I love the rapper from uh, Chateau de la Fuente. I love Sumatra, Ecuador. Uh, I love uh, uh, Mexican San Andres, good Havanos. But to me, to me, it's just unique. I remember when I started and I was talking on the show and somebody inboxed me on Facebook and said, I can't believe it. Now you're saying the Cameroon is this because you're working with the Fuentes. And I remember the guy. And I got kind of a little bit angry, but I don't show my emotions uh, that much. And then I said, so-and-so, weren't you three years ago at a seminar at X and X uh, store? He says, yeah, I remember I was there. Do you remember when somebody asked me, what's the best rapper in the world? And he said to me, shit, I put my foot in my mouth again. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean any disrespect. I have loved Cameroon for the last 35 years. And Carlito and I have talked about it. And when I saw uh, Jeremiah at the show last year and I saw the campaign that they were trying to bring back what's, what's really theirs, yeah. what his father that lost it all in Cameroon. We have Cameroon tobacco today because of Josh and Jeremiah. Absolutely. If not, Cameroon would have disappeared. And I mean, Carlito's going to talk about it a little bit later. But it's so, I remember that Carlito told me once that Don Carlos said that Cameroon was so noble that even if you would take tobacco that was not that great, it could make a good cigar. So that's not something you could do with all types of rapper. And I always tell people that the uniqueness of Cameroon is the, is the aroma, it's the flavor, it's the, uh, the sweetness, the spice that has it that just harmonizes and just blends great. I made a blend one time. I got some Cuban tobacco that a friend of mine gave me in, uh, in Canada. And I took a little, like a, a leaf of Cameroon. Uh, I took a the Cameroon wrapper. I put a Dominican Piloto Cubano binder. I took a strip of uh, Corojo 99, half a leaf, I think it was Nicaragua. It was a blend that I made. And when I put that wrapper and I put all that together, I made about 10 to 12 cigars. I thought I was in heaven. What that, what that wrapper brings, it's, it's, I mean, it's just, and even though I've loved it, but Carlito has worked with it all his life, I would like to hear Carlito's two cents. And if you don't agree with me, we just don't agree. I think Carlito's on mute. Okay. I, okay. okay. Yep. Let me rephrase that. Maybe it, it's best that I was on mute. <laughs> say, I hate to say I agree with you. Uh, you know, Cameroon is unique. And anytime you have something that great that is unique, it's truly special and should be preserved. If it's lost, it's probably lost forever. And you mentioned it's true without Jeremiah and Joshua, who have continued to follow this footstep. And to say, I think Jeremiah was 21 or something when he lost his father. You know, these, these are two, and, and Joshua's a couple of years younger. These were two young boys that, you know, had a company, a government takeover, had everything compensated, lost everything to practically start, not from zero, but in incredible debt when, you know, not only your land, your warehouses, your infrastructure, everything taken away overnight. But we got to get credit to Rick Marifel also because, and, and some to Heller, it's because Heller was the great, uh, the great uh, trader, you know, uh, man of selling Cameroon. But when the French monopoly decided to pull out of, of Cameroon, it was Rick Marifel that told me, Carlito, don't worry. I'm not going to let you, you know, lose everything you built on Cameroon that you believed in us. And it was Rick who went back to Cameroon and started that organization and was the pioneer and really did that. And the children followed his footsteps and everything, but followed it after everything was lost because Rick lost, uh, Richard Marifel lost everything and uh, every, he lost everything overnight. He was at my house when he got the call in the Dominican Republic. He came to celebrate his birthday. And uh, 
three days later, I think it was three days later, four, had a massive heart attack. And I still to this day really believe because I knew Rick well, was in perfect shape, was in the gym. He was thin, strong, full of life and full of energy. Those that knew him, uh, you know, and he had just gotten a complete physical and he was in great shape and everything and stress and all these things that he had on him. I think I really still today, and maybe for that reason that I have such a, an affection of your responsibility with the, with the children, which are Jeremiah and Joshua, which are elderly now, or they're on the way to becoming old men. But, you know, also to Rick for his sacrifice that he did for the industry. It means a lot to me. So I got that special attachment with Cameroon. But my father always said, and I believe it from my experience, there's no b better blending tobacco than Cameroon. It blends with almost anything. And it really is such a noble tobacco. It, the certain sweetness, if it's good Cameroon and it's fermented and everything, because like everything else, there's good and bad and everything. But the right Cameroon, the right grades, you know, is something very, very special. Is it the best in the world? I'm not going to say it's the best in the world. To me, it is, but it's a question of personal taste also. But one thing I'm going to say, Jose, that you did not, where you say is, is, is the most difficult wrapper to work. Uh, the yield as a manufacturer is the most expensive tobacco in the world. And it takes a lot of patience that you go through a bale and you have to remove, or you only could use a, a small percentage of that tobacco for your cigars or premium cigars. If you want to choose the best of the best, because it's grown under conditions that are very difficult and it's you know, grown in the rainforest and it's mother nature, hundred percent. So there's so, there's so many elements that, you know, unpredictable, but it's still the taste of Cameroon. If there would have been something that we could substitute it with, it would have been a change decades ago when all the difficulties, when it wasn't available or what was available was very small. And believe me, I don't think there's a manufacturer who hasn't tried and we have tried, but we have not found something that replaces the taste and the characteristics of Cameroon. Bro. Yeah, very, very true. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I heard, we heard Jeremiah's story when we had him on the show and anyone who hasn't heard that story, like from his words, you're, you're never going to smoke a Cameroon cigar the same again, is what I'm just going to tell you. Um, and, and not because, it, yes, the story is incredible. It's, it's, it's a very emotional story, but you'll understand too, like, cause you'll go back and when you smoke the Cameroon and start thinking about what Jeremiah was saying. It's it's completely true. Um, you know, if we look if we look back in history, Will, and you look back in the '60s, and during the mid '60s and everything, when Cuban wrappers were no longer available, right? Cameroon, Cameroon for premium cigars was the most sought after wrapper. Yeah. It was the best, and it just it was the best. If you look at the big brands that were in the late '60s, early '70s, you know, Monte Cruz, Flamenco, the brands from Canary Island with Menendez and Garcia. Uh, Royal Jamaican, uh, you know, all the, you know, La Aurora. Partagas. Partagas, but before Partagas, Stanford Newman, he was one of the first with Cameroon also that made 90, Cuesta Ray 95s, all along fill of Cameroon. It was very, very popular. Then it became difficult after the French Monopoly. Prices kept going through the roof. We had, we, we used to go out there and bid for tobacco. Everybody would bid against each other. It was a live auction. I mean, not, not a live auction. It was a silent auction. You made bids. You didn't know what you were going to get. It, it was so strange the way we had to buy tobacco, who got what and so forth. And that's where the Marifels were really expert heller. Okay, you could, you want this type of tobacco, but there's a lot with good and bad, light, dark, and this and that. I have to get, I have a customer for this tobacco, this tobacco you want, this tobacco. I mean, it was very, very complicated. People got discouraged and when France pulled out, it was the end of Cameroon to Rick Marifel went back. And he kept us in business and some of our flagship brand, which was the Four Fina A58 and then Hemingway, it's, it, it was, it depended on Cameroon. And Richard Marifel said, don't worry, you will have your Cameroon. And that's, wh that's where we're at and everything. That's why it's so important to us because we build our business back, you know, from, from the early 70s, in 1970, early 70 was built on Cameroon. 
And, and you know, Carlito and Jose, with Cameroon, I mean, and especially hearing this from Jeremiah, it's the story of where they grow this, where this tobacco is grown. I mean, a lot of us who have traveled to cigar countries have been spoiled. Like the access to get to the farms and, and where this stuff is. And when you hear Jeremiah telling the stories about how he's sleeping outside and stuff like that, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, it blew us away. It blew us all away. I mean, it, this is, it's, it's not like, it's not like it is in the Dominican Republic or Nicaragua for sure. No, not at all. Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. You're not in the Hotel Gran Almirante yeah. or, or in, you know, even in Esteli, you know, it's, it's just a different world. It, it, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And compare, comparing comparing Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic to to Cameroon is probably like comparing whatever you know, one of a, a third world country to Dubai. You know, it's yeah. it's very very difficult, and it, it and it, it had a they had a big price to pay. Yeah. Not only Richard, we know the price he paid, but but also Jeremiah. You know, the the wear and tear on their bodies, going in jeeps for. 12 hours just bumping up and everything. Yeah. I mean, their backs and, you know, all kind of, uh, you know, getting all kind of uh, different fevers and nobody even knew what they were. And, you know, the, the sacrifice, the commitment that they made is very commendable. So Absolutely. there's a lot more, you know, you get attached. There's a lot more. Again, I, I want to say there's a lot of great rappers and not everybody likes that rappers. Not that it's better than everyone, but it's unique. And it's something that that is very special. And if you like it, Unfortunately, unfortunately, there's not something that you can replace it with and it will be the same. Very true. Oof. Very true. Um, Bear, how you wanna take the next one? I I lost my sound for a little bit, so I'm back now. No problem. Yeah. So it, it that brings about a certain a really good point, uh, Carlito. You know, you talk about Cameroon and how it's it stood the test of time and has been a centralized component to uh, to uh, Fuente cigars and to your own palate, even personally, and even to Jose's palate personally. Um, but that kind of leads me into this next question. I thought this was a really unique opportunity having you both on the show tonight to talk about a similar experience, but from two very unique perspectives. You know, we're coming into the end of the year, and for us in the cigar industry, particularly in cigar media, this is what we really like. This is uh, this is top 25 season. You know, so top 25 cigars of the year in Cigar Aficionado, of course, which is the uh, the the uh, the premiere of all the lists. I have a top 10 list. Coop has a top 30 list. I mean, there's lists all over the place, left and right. Um, but specifically about the Cigar Aficionado top 25 list. You are, you are a recipient of the number one cigar of the year. Jose's had tremendous success, so an incredible run of consecutive years at La Aurora, being in the top 10, top five, even um, putting together some incredible cigars that have made that list. You know, I'm eager to, in, I'm, I'm anxious to hear from this, these two unique perspectives of these two gentlemen in front of me. What does it take in your, each of your eyes to, to consistently appear on one of the most iconic lists that all of us look at year after year. Yep. I'm going to let Carlito go first. Should you go first or I? I'm going to let you go because you're older than me. Well, okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. I should go first. I'm the elder. <laughs> no, I think, honestly, I think it's, and I don't want this to come across the wrong way because that's not my intention. It's just to be honest. Is don't think about the list. Forget about the list. Make the best cigar you can. And regardless of where you fall, keep trying to make the best cigar you can. Find out how to make whatever you're making better or, or not find out. Work to make it better every single thing you do. And I see it a lot. I, because in the very beginning, remember, we were never judged. And, and you know, when I started with my father in my father's time, and all of a sudden in the 90s, you know, we've been around for a lot longer than since the 90s, people starting to judge you and everything. And you're thinking in the very beginning, what the hell do they know about tobacco or cigars <laughs> or, things, or the sacrifice that goes through or how old the age tobacco and this and that. And they're giving a high rating of cigar to somebody who's making of cigars, but they've only been in business a year. They're using raw tobacco. There's no tobacco. We went through all that many, many years ago. 
and it, it was a shock, but we got used to it. Then I realized myself personally, I'm talking for myself. This is like the Academy Awards or the Grammys. One year it belongs to somebody, the next year it belongs to somebody else. And you know what? It's a colleague, be happy and celebrate with them. It is a great feeling. There's no greater feeling in the world than when you're recognized by your peers or the media and you get and you get recognition. But but it's not something that you could, it's not something that it could make or break your year. I, I just think that it's something that it's it's the world we live in. And I we, I myself some well, if I find out that we got a great rating, I celebrate, but it, 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 it finishes fast. It's not a celebration because I got to keep doing what I do. I don't, it's very important, especially I think for a new brand or someone that is new and, 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 and it really brings awareness. I know that if you got one of the top five cigars years ago, one of the big publications, of course, Cigar Aficionado, and others, all of a sudden, people are going out to try it and everything. And it does bring awareness and it does bring attention. But I think that uh, it's something for myself personally is that I've learned just, you know, you just got to keep working and stay focused to what you're doing and everything. And if we're blessed and we're fortunate enough that we're recognized, then, you know, I'm very happy and everything. But I'm also very happy when I see someone that gets recognized, that deserves recognition and it strengthens our entire industry for gives people an opportunity to taste different things and to help because I really believe that the stronger my colleagues are, the stronger our industry is. And if they have the same philosophy that I have, that they believe in the brick and mortar, they believe in family business, and they respect those that have been there before us, and they respect they respect the, the industry and they respect other manufacturers and they respect the consumer and they respect the people that are working around the clock, you know, not punching a time clock, the brick and mortar we're referring to. And I think that it's wonderful when they're recognized and they become stronger because I think that it only enhances the entire industry. So that is my perspective of it. I just hope this year I get a lot of number ones and everything because I've been locked down for a long time. I could use a celebration. <laughs> Listen, uh, I'm going to agree almost on everything that Carlito says because except, it's true. Because no, no, there's no, no, there's no except. Oh, man, it's no except. No, I'm going to give you my two cents on this. Is the list, especially from CA, very important also to People's Cigar Journal, also uh, some of the most prestigious uh, guys that do their list like Coop and the people of Half Wheel and all that. I agree with that. But you can't be focusing all the time on if I'm, I'm going to get it, if I'm going to get it, if I don't get it. I believe what Carlito says, you got to do what you got to do, make cigars better and better every day. But at the same time, and I agree 110% with Carlito, when you've been there for two or three years and all of a sudden you get that number three, that number two cigar of the year, that changes your life for you. That is something that uh, we, uh, we cannot deny. And also, if today the industry, as at the point, it has been, we still, and I know a lot of people don't like cigar aficionado. Some people love cigar aficionado, but that is something that I will never accept. And I've had a lot of discussions with people when people go and bad mouth the magazine, people that today are doing very, very well. If would, if would have not been for Marvin Shankin back in 92, and I think on the second attempt to bring the magazine we would have not had a boom. We would have not had, uh, then the boom went down, but then the industry came back. And I personally believe that the last eight or 10 years have been great, great years for our industry, even though FDA smoking bans, uh, taxes and all that, but we have to give credit to the magazine. And I wish, you know, you're not gonna get number one every year or number two or number three, but just if you're mentioned on the top 25, it's a recognition. And also if it comes from other magazines too. So at the end of the day, I believe uh, what Carlito says, we've got to try to do better cigars, not better cigars, I'm gonna take that back. Just keep making the consistent quality cigars that we've been doing for year after year after year. Because like I've said, and we don't have to mention brands or people. How many people do we know that have one great year 
then two years later, they totally disappear or their sales have gone down. Why? Because they have not been consistent. Yeah. At the end of the day, people ask me, what's the most important thing? I say, one word. I said, it's actually three words. They say, what? I said, consistency, consistency, consistency. It's like I tell a lot of people, you may like Puente and maybe you're not, but just look at this. They've been doing it for 108 years. So I guess they're doing something right. So those are my uh, two cents on that one. Yeah, you know, I agree with both of you on that. And, and you know, it's, I've actually, a lot of us in the online media, we we tend to focus on what's new a lot. But in recent years, I've kind of told people, and Bear and I have talked about this, and Aaron, on the shows we've done over the years, that, you know, what Cigar Fish and I was doing with their top 25 is, is a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like a playoff it's a, that they're doing. It's a tournament. And certain cigars every year place well in the tournament. And I've heard all the theories about that. But no one's going to deny that those cigars are not consistent and why they're landed on there. You know, you look at, you know, I go back to, to 2005 number one cigar, the Opus X uh, Double Corona. That's still a great, great cigar. You know, it, it, it's, it's 15 years ago. But that is still a great cigar, and and it's a great. I, I actually think that's the year they got it right, um, because that's but that size is always smoked consistently with me, and now we just saw it with Ida Shark. You just got another ninety five on that cigar, that just came out. So I mean that again, you're looking at that. That cigar is consistently performing well, um, and. Uh, I know I got my sharks last week, which was good. <laughs> so I was able to, someone held them for me and I was able to get mine. So, um, you know, it, it's exciting. I think it's a testament to what you, you are all bring to the table with that. Um, and, you know, I think I, I love what that, I love that aspect of what it brings to the table. And that the fact Cooper, that you guys have, can, yeah. Yeah, it's, you're absolutely right. It's true. I just want to add that, that double Fuente, double Corona. I think to me, it's one of the most enjoyable, consistent yeah, cigars. It's a difficult cigar to make. We only have one person that makes the Fuente of us. It's the same person that made it when it came out the number one cigar of the year. It's the same tobacco. It's the same exact cigar. But it's, it's just the perception of judgment of things and it's done accurately. And I'm just so grateful for Cigar Aficionado that I don't criticize them where we're not, you know, when when a, a Fuente Opus Sex is not even in the top 25. They got other things to do. I understand that. But I am just so grateful because if it wasn't for a cigar aficionado in 1992, those years when everything started, we may not be on this program tonight because I think that that was the catalyst that started everything to bring awareness and people and everything. So, and, and I just think it's great because it brings you know, it, it brings so much interest and enthusiasm and it gives people an opportunity to be seen. So, you know, it, there's more than 25 cigars, obviously, and some are great and some some great cigars fall out of the radar. But that's where I think, I really believe that the results of a cigar aficionado, of, of uh, your journalism, of like Jose mentioned, Cigar Journal, and the other ones, are, I gotta say Cigar Snob because He's a dear friend of mine and everything and, and everyone and half wheel and everybody who's active out there. The result is that consumers have become educated. They make the decision and the more educated they come, the more everybody has their own ideas and what they perceive to be the best. And the more information has come out, we all know that we have different tastes, we have different ideas, we have different perceptions of things. Maybe some cigar was on at that moment for the humidity and everything was perfect. And maybe another time for some reason it was off. But I think the most important result of this, the outcome is that consumers have, have become, and they continue to become education to make their own decision, their own judgment of what they enjoy and don't enjoy and be able to talk about it and to be able to argue about it and be able to debate it, why this should be and that be. And that's what we see after you have one of the top 25s or we have a number one with with uh, these judges and then another, these, and all of a sudden you got all this debate and everything, which I think is exciting. It's when you see uh, people debating on social media, no, I like this better and this cigar should have got number one and this one shouldn't be there and this one should. I think that's what brings life to our industry. We love doing so that, exactly. That, 
Yeah, I, I so I'm wholeheartedly in favor, regardless who comes out on top or or whatever it is. I really believe that that's been a great contribution to the industry. Agree, agree. Um, I want to also be sensitive to everyone's time here tonight. Um, so I have two more topics that I'd like to hit. I'm okay. good. I don't know about Jose. Jose, Jose, keep an eye on your watch. Don't forget the ducks, please. Hey, Carlito, let me let me tell uh, everybody out there. I will not go back to bed. If we're here still for another hour, I'm enjoying, even though I would have liked to be alone with Carlito because he's busting my balls all the time. <laughs> but uh, no, we don't have we don't have a problem, hey. Carlito. Carlito goes to bed very late. I go to bed very late. So to me, I'll just uh, in an hour uh, get Jasper up, help him with them and go to school. So I still have about an hour, feed the ducks, and uh, I'll probably make another cup of coffee. I'm still enjoying this eye of the shark that I have, uh, this, uh, the, uh, this cigar that Don Carlos, uh, that to me, I've been smoking it for over an hour very slow. It's rich, it's spicy, it's balanced, it's full flavor. And like I write sometimes on social media, it's everything you want in the cigar and a bit more. Awesome. awesome. Dude, before going to those two topics, I was hoping that uh, Carlito would do me an honor. Because oh, I, I, ne yes. I, need, I need to pick my next cigar. Yes, yes, we have to do that. It's a tradition. Yes. Yes. So, Carlito, I, I normally uh, I normally ask my our guests of honor to pick a cigar for me, and I didn't. I was really excited to to smoke the Casa Cuba, which I just finished. But I have two choices here, and I would like I would it would honor me if you picked my next cigar for me. So, uh, the first cigar that I have is uh, well, a cigar that uh, that uh, Jose was just talking about, the uh, Don Carlos Personal Reserve, the Robusto, and I have the uh, very unique Triple Eight. Uh, Reserva Extra Viejo, the Anejo. Oh. So, so that's uh, a hard choice. That's a hard choice. Well, honestly, you had a Casa Cuba. So, if you want something, you want something bigger than the Casa Cuba, I will go with the 888. That is bigger, it's more condensed. It's like going from a Bentley to uh, Lamborghini, basically, <laughs> far as power, strength, and this and that. And of course, it's uh, a, a, th a thinner diameter, thinner profile, so it's gonna be a it's gonna be a smoke that you're gonna feel it more. But if you want elegance and everything, and you want something that's round and it's gonna be complete, I would suggest tonight, in honor of my father, who I'm sure he's looking down, watching and everything, because he probably put the alarm clock because somehow he heard that uh, that Liana was going to be on. He wouldn't do this for me or Jose, but if his <laughs> granddaughter's going to be on, I'm sure he's up in the clouds looking down and watching the show. So in honor of my father, I would do the Don Carlos Personal Reserve. You got and it. Ho and hopefully it's not a it's a suggestion that I won't regret. I got mine too. It won't be. Yep. I'm smoking Thank the uh, the, Oro, the Oro Oscuro, which is wow. Uh, Carlito knows I love this cigar. I have to say something now. Uh, so does the so does the U.S. Customs. <laughs> oh yes, they do. <laughs> hit by U.S. Customs. We were saying, those cigars were a total surprise. We didn't tell anyone we were sending those cigars to the market. That was something to help the brick and mortar, and that shipment was held up uh, for a while. And they they literally they're going through. I don't know what's going on. I suspect that maybe I shouldn't get involved with government things that. You know, several trailers last year, uh, they were they were stolen. So you know, customs in Miami or in Florida, I think they're thinking, why are they stealing trailers? But I think Drew Estate had a trailer stolen, and we had a trailer stolen before them. And I don't know who else if there's someone else, but it, it kind of brought a red flag to customs and the shipments, all of them. We have two trailers, big containers that were coming for the holidays. And they have been uh, they have been retained there for a while. The checking one's being released, so some of the surprises that should have been in the market two weeks ago should be, start being shipped tomorrow. And then I want to say now in the program, those are who are watching uh, tonight that they're, they're going to be the first to hear this. And this I've been dropping little hints, but there's something else that we never told anybody that was being shipped. Something that I made a couple of years ago. 
and it was put aside, it's going to be napalm when we drop it. And this is going to go in for the brick and mortar, for the members in good standing with a PCA. I promised it. It has nothing to do with the pinks. The pinks are coming too. They're there. Some of the pinks are in Tampa. The second shipment is, is being held and they're waiting because they don't want to send to one part of the market and the other part don't get, don't have and so forth and start all kind of problems. But there's something else that I'm not going to say what it is, but I made a promise and it's going to be something unbelievable because I expect for all the brick and mortar retailers to be able to celebrate this year with a bang. And, and it, that's all I can say for right now. But, and I talked to Rich Dolak, who is my contact at headquarters. And he says, you know, when a trader gets here, it's leaving the next, you know, we're packing and we already know the orders and we know what's on the trailer. So everything's preset. Every customer knows how much we're going to get. So you're going to hear about it. And all they're going to get, receive the cigars. So it's a retail listing and an invoice. They're not going to get any description what the cigar is. They're, they're going to do it the way Fuente did it for a long time. If they don't want it, we'll take it back but it's going to be something that's going to just create, it's going to be very good for them. And I promise, and I'm going to come through, God willing, customs and release it. I have to say something on the subject that uh, <clears throat> Bear brought up about the Don Carlos personal reserve and the 888. In my opinion, this is just me not being very biased. The best cigar, in my opinion, with a Cameroon wrapper, is the Don Carlos personal reserve. I've had the, the I yep. still might have one left that I was uh, always be picking people up at the airport and Don Carlos would be the first to come out. And he would always ask me, Blanco, tienes un encendedor, you got a light? And I would take out my light, Don Carlos would light it right away. And he would always, because I would never, to Carlito's pocket, I don't mind pickpocketing it, but don't, out of respect <laughs> to Don Carlos, and he would always put that cigar in my pocket and I would say, Don Carlos, buenas noches, muchas gracias. And the other thing, Carlito knows that my favorite Añejo was always the, the 46. The Mine five too. And a half by 46. Mine too. But, but I got the other day a little surprise from Jeremiah and they sent me the 888. I got to tell you something. Even though the 46 is still going to be my favorite, but in the line... And I don't like to, uh, you know, put on scales what cigar is better. They're all good. But to me, that 888 is memorable and just out of this world. I only have five left. So, please, anybody. Well, I'm far away from anybody. So, nobody's getting them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, it's so unique. It is. So, Absolutely. It's such a unique size. Uh, and in the Opus X, it's a great size, too, I might add. Oh, yeah, yeah, I smoked that when we had Carlito on uh, last time. Yeah. The uh, a tradition I didn't tell you about Carlito. I know that our audience is very familiar with it. And Coop is very familiar with it as well. So every year the anejos are released about this time of year, just before Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so my Thanksgiving tradition is I always buy two of the same size. I smoke others, of course, but I always buy two of the same size. It's a different size each year, and then I smoke one that year. And then the following year I smoke the Anejo from the previous year on Thanksgiving day. That's my, that's my Thanksgiving tradition. Wow. Wow. And uh, the, the first year that the 888 came across, uh, that was, that was my cigar pick and, and, uh, um, and true to form, like it always does. The Anejo smokes, they smoke so good out of the box, but they, yeah. that, that one year mark is, mm -hmm. Oh, course. it's magic. You it's know, absolutely we, magic. Before we actually, before we box them, we actually, they're aging the age room a year after they're made. But, you know, you mentioned Thanksgiving, uh, Bear. The Anejos originally was made to release on Thanksgiving every year because the Anejos came about after the, the hurricane that we had, the, the Chapel Point that was destroyed. And um, we had wrappers, you know, in inventory, but I didn't know. You know, we had no wrappers that year that we were growing. It was destroyed. We didn't know we were ever going to recover. We had to rebuild the farm, rebuild every barn. I mean, we were almost a year with lights at night and everything with uh, power plants, taking our shoes, tires that came in from the river because our river goes right through the farm. It's one of the, the Rio Yuna, one of the main rivers in the center of the country. And, uh, you know, it was a very difficult time. So I put my... 
I thought at that time that our very best cigar makers were the Oversex cigar makers. This was back in uh, in the late 90s. So it all came about that I said, what am I going to do with the best cigar makers? They're, they only make a few cigars a day because the way they were trained and they make, you know, their, their scales of pay is much higher and they're not capable of making more cigars in a different cigar. What I'm going to do with them, I'm going to let them go. These are the people that we've trained. They've been the longest. And this is where everything came about that the Anejo started with the same cigar makers that the point that went over sex. And uh, so since we had so very few, we were only making them, we started releasing it every year in uh, Thanksgiving. So it's ironic how you mentioned Thanksgiving that that really started out as the Thanksgiving cigar. It was the time of the year we targeted. We made so many, aged them a year for the next year we released them in Thanksgiving or near Thanksgiving to have it through the end of the year. So I appreciate you bringing that up because it brings back memories and we don't want to forget, you know, how things started. One of my favorite traditions. Thank you. When, when, and I do this, by the way, I do the same thing. And, and two years ago when I was really sick and I didn't know I was going into the hospital a day later, uh, I had to skip that Thanksgiving tradition and it was painful uh, to do that. Um, so the year after, when I resumed that, it was a, a wonderful thing to do. Uh, it just was because uh, that Thanksgiving and the Añejo to me are always synonymous. It's it's I've done the same thing, and this is I've been doing it. Barry and I didn't even know each other when I started doing it either. So it was kind of uh, mm. um, it was just kind of coincidental. When we, I remember we talked about that. So uh, and I this year I actually lit up the uh, the eight 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 this year as well for Thanksgiving, and it was wonderful. One, it was I like, want, you know, I never thought about it because I've been living in the Dominican Republic for 40 years, but I wonder how it pairs with eight nine. It's a good question. I haven't tried it. I you usually know, drink it with tequila, to be honest. When I, when I was living in Tampa, Florida, growing up, I remember eight nine, you know, hitting the, the grocery shelves, and I loved it, you know. I don't know if you guys know what it is. Yeah, we know. But, yeah. Uh, oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but later on in my high school years, I really liked it. It went really well with the wild turkey. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's it, it, it's beautiful. It, it pairs with a lot. I mean, I actually paired it with rum, and I like it too. Yeah, of course. I, it's perfectly rum. I could yeah, imagine that. Yeah, yeah. They not rum it. And it <laughs> warm it and warm it up for a cold day in front of a fireplace. Absolutely. Yeah. I always yeah. pair it with a uh, anejo uh, tequila. Yeah. That's my that's my yeah. Thanksgiving tradition is anejo with a anejo anejo cigar with an anejo tequila. Um, on after Thanksgiving dinner, it is, it's it's magic. And, and which tequila is it? Añejo or uh, reposado? Añejo. Añejo, Añejo. Yeah, I go darker. Yeah, it it and it seemed appropriate. Añejo, well, and Añejo. I love, I love tequila. Maybe I've done yeah. it because I've done so many things, but I don't recall being consciously when I do it. You know, but uh, I'm gonna definitely try that next. I'll try it. That's an excuse for me to give myself my tequila yeah. and, and experiment. There you go. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I got to share one more like story on, on us around the Thanksgiving cigar um, with Carlito. Um, Cause I don't think I told this story, but I've told it, I think on the air. So um, my daughter got engaged in 2014 on Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, my son-in-law came, calls me up. He says, I need to come and talk to you. Right. And um, I knew what it was. So I knew he was going to ask for a blessing to get married, right? And I was going to give it, right? Um, but I decided I was going to make it really, really tough for him, right? So what I did is I used the technique we used to use on our sales reps is when they gave their first presentation internally is I turned the heat up to an extraordinarily high temperature in, in the smoking room, right? <laughs> um, and, but what happened is, and I did that, right? Except when he walks in, the first thing he walked in with Carlito was the was uh, the three finger uh, tin with the angel shares, and that was the cigar he handed me. <laughs> <laughs> but I still kept the heat on anyway. You know what? I tell you, you know, you just reminded me when well, my son-in-law the same thing. God, they were dating. I think since they were fifteen, and they're already going. They're in their mid thirties. You know, he we went to dinner. You know, they, we had a big dinner. We had a big steak dinner, a beautiful restaurant. And he kept on, you know, hey, Pops, you know, it's cold as shit in Tampa. I, 
it might have been, you know, the winter, whatever it was, and we're inside the house. We, could we not falling asleep? It's like midnight, or oh, we're always probably very getting close to one o'clock. We had drank a lot of wine and everything. And we're talking, he says, you know what? And he doesn't ever do this. And all of a sudden, my son in law wants to smoke a cigar with me outside, cold as hell. And, and I'm there. And I'm smoking a cigar with him, cigars going down, and I see him, he keeps going around the bush and everything. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, man, I've been there. Come on, you're you're already a grown man, a dog. Shoot, you know, shoot it, man, you know, whatever. And he when he very politely asked me for permission to marry my daughter. So when you mentioned that about the son in law, you know, gotta be tough and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and over cigar also, the cigar always comes into play. And I, the funny thing is, I asked him, I said, "How did you get these?" Right? I'm like, "How did you get these?" Because he's not a, a regular cigar buyer, right? He goes, I, "He goes honestly, he goes, they just told me I was in the in at the right day. They just come, I guess they just got a shipment recently, and he was looking for something to give to me. And the, and the tobacconist said, "I just got these like uh, at, at whatever time he just gotten some of them, and he ha- or he had some left. He didn't have a lot of them, and he said, here, so give this your." your uh, future father-in-law I'm like wow uh oh, there yeah. you go yep so uh it that was, was very, smart. that was smart of him That's- very <laughs> smart of him yeah very i said wow i said you <laughs> you put some effort I into like it this guy already. that's probably when you first thought this i like this guy already <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> I'm not exactly. losing a daughter making the son. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ex- exactly. So it was be- it was beautiful. Yeah, and then uh you know, my oldest son and, and my son-in-law are the two cigar smokers in the family. So, uh, yeah, they do they do uh, well. That's great. That's great. All right. All right. I got a question for both of you guys. Um, you hear every year um, Time Magazine, okay, does a Person of the Year award, um, which is basically, you know, they pick a Person of the Year or people or something, which is a um, – to do that uh we do it also on our we actually do it on our show as well uh carlito your father won it in 2016 by the way just so you know that um that was uh yeah so we to to tribute his whole career but 2020 right and you could there's no right or wrong answer who are your 2020 person of the year in the cigar industry Holy shit. And if you don't feel comfortable ask, answering it, I'm okay with that too. I want to be no, honest. Yeah, I'll like, be honest too. Okay. No, I want to be honest. I'm just thinking. Yeah, I'm not going to say who we've actually started the process already. And I think I know who's going to, I'm not going to say who's going to win it, but I think I, I have an idea who's going to win it with us. We have to go through the final votes still, but. Um, but yeah, I'm it, sure whoever wins it, I'm sure they deserve it. There's so whatever, I just think it right now. But you know, you talk about Time Magazine. I start hearing all these things on the news about you know, it it doesn't matter if he's the most hated or accomplished the most. And I hear right. the possibility of of President Trump or ex President Trump, whatever you want to refer it. And then I hear about you know President elect Biden and Harris and maybe so and so and maybe this and maybe Dr. Fauci. Not thinking to myself, man, what the hell are these people doing? If there's anybody that should be on Time Magazine to cover, it should be the word Carlito is bobblehead. That <laughs> bobblehead has been from everywhere to every oh, camera. Absolutely, he's been, yeah. He's been <laughs> it's been in, in, in all the aircraft carrier. It's been in, in the Alps. It's been all over the world. The bobblehead should be on the Time Magazine, not, not the political figure, but no. You talk Absolutely. about the cigar. I'm, I'm joking, obviously. Yeah, right, right. But I didn't think about it. I heard about all these political <laughs> guys, Dr. Fauci and all this. I said, shit. <laughs> the bobble has been all over the world. But people in the industry, who should it be? Myself, if I would say something, I mean, this is, I don't expect this has nothing to do with it. It may come to a shock. But I think somebody that should deserve consideration at least not to win because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are very uh, qualified. I would say Liana Fuente for the example that she led for what she's done 
of being, you know, I would think it's out of the box, but and maybe it's personal. But to myself, you're asking me, I say Liana Fuente. An excellent you're, choice. You're doing it for working. I think she is someone that no one would ever consider. But I think that her contribution to humanity and what she's done and awareness and so forth, I think that that's my opinion. That I just want to be honest that I. It's that a I great pick. It. It's a great pick. Uh, you know, it's gonna it's gonna sound like. Uh, did you guys talk about this? I had two choices. Uh, one that's not in the industry anymore, which I think uh, Carlito knows. No, well, I know what that side. issue is. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Who you're going to say now? The first one came to my mind that really deserves to be on. In Mount Rushmore. Yes. Benji Menendez, with, Benji Menendez, without a doubt. I called him tonight because uh, uh, Carlito and I wanted to uh, confirm something and uh, we found out something very interesting. Well, say it, Jose. Yeah, Benji Menendez, Benji Menendez, without a doubt. And the other one that I had, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm disagreeing with Carlito was Liana because of what she did to take off her hair, to raise $85,000, to go out there for that last month, asking for dollars, $5, and all the people in the industry that always contributed to, I would say my choice would be Liana. And not because I'm working, because she's Carlito's daughter, it's because of the efforts that she has done, the way she has handled herself. So that would be uh, my choice. And there's a lot of great people that deserve it. But to me, those two people. But uh, going back to Benji, Carlito and I have talked and we talked about on our show, we, he was on the show with Light Em Up, which to me has been one of the best shows I've had the privilege to be on when Cynthia got on, Ernesto Perez Carrillo, uh, Rick Rodriguez, uh, Jeremiah, Jenner from uh, uh, Hunters and Frankau. I mean, that was an amazing, he was in tears. He was so emotional and it's, it's sad that we don't have all these videos and all these interviews with Benji for future generations. Because to me, I've said it a million times, he's the last of the living legends. Thank God he's still sharp. He's 84, he's still smoking cigars. 85. Every time I, 85, and every time I call him, the first thing he says, como esta Carlito? How's Emma? What's happening? What's new? But other than that, that would be my two choices, uh, 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 Liana and, and Benjamin Endes. Great picks, uh, and it's a very tough competition, yeah. what I'll say, too, because um, it's, it's even – there's been a lot of great stories this year. Um, so we do appreciate, you know, definitely you guys uh, weighing in on that, um, for I sure. I want to say something. I want to say something, Coop, and uh, uh -huh. Carlito heard the story, and you've heard it. I was doing Cigar Dojo a couple of months ago. I, I love Eric. Him and Jordan do a great job. <clears throat> and he asked me, I don't want to put you in a tough spot, but if you were to do uh, Mount Rushmore, who would be the four people you would put on it? And I said, man, that's going to, that's a tough question. But after that, I thought about maybe 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. And I said, it's going to be very easy. First of all, the last of the living legends, Benji Menendez, Uncle Benji. Of course, Don Carlo Fuente. Third, uh, the Jose Orlando Padron, and fourth, maybe the less known of them, but probably the person, and I think Carlito agrees with me, that was the most knowledgeable person in Dominican Republic, Fernando Leon. And Eric said to me, that has been the best, and we've asked it to many people, the best four to be on Mount Rushmore. And to me, uh, a lot of people got back to me and said like, wow, what four great picks. Because at the end of the day, it's not because they, they become millionaires or they sold millions of cigars. It's their contribution to our industry. Yep. What Fernando went through, what Don Carlos went through, what Benji went through. Benji was a multimillionaire in the 50s and they lost it all. Jose Orlando Padron, which I only spoke with him a couple of times, but Carlito and Don Carlos were very close to him. And people don't understand because people see the glory of all these companies, but they don't see what they've been through. 
what the Padrones went through with Don Carlos, burned down in, in, in Carlito, burned down in Nicaragua, burned down in Honduras, going back to DR with hardly anything and doing this. So to me, I will always respect those four people. And of course, there's other people that, you know, we, uh, we're not going to get into mentioning names, but people have to remember those people who were the pioneers who have brought this great industry to the point where we are today. Very true. Very true. And you talk about Fernando Leon, um, you know, he, uh, maybe a name a lot of the newer smokers don't know, um, but, but a tremendous titan in the industry, too. Um, and, you know, I remember, I mean, Jose, you had already left La Aurora when, when they finally released his blend, right? I don't think you might have already left at that point. And that was a very, very, so, yeah. that cigar, I keep telling the Fernando Leon, what a blend that was that, that got released. It's it's the most underrated mm-hmm. blend in the La Aurora portfolio to date. I mean, it's a fantastic cigar. And uh, and maybe a lot of people don't know that. Maybe Carlito would uh, would like to elaborate the relationship between Don Carlos, Carlito with Fernando Leon was, I mean, amazing. I found out things that. Uh, it was just mind blowing to me that Carlito told me I had I knew the respect. I'm gonna tell a story. I'm gonna tell a story that I I'm gonna make it public today. I I told this story to Carlito about a couple of months ago. We all know the controversy that came out when the Opus cigar came out. A lot of our colleagues, a lot of friends, doubted it and doubted it and doubted it and made up all this BS. I was in Don Fernando's office one day talking with him and somebody that is not alive anymore came into the office and said to Don Fernando, how about this shit that the Fuentes is saying about their growing rapper there? And uh, we think it's in Ecuador. It could be from Nicaragua. It could be from Honduras. Don Fernando, which Carlito just stared at him and said these words. If Carlos Fuentes says it's grown by them, I don't want to hear another word about that. And that, to me, is respect. First time I'm saying this, Carlito, because I think people have to know this. That's true. The first time you say it, but you did mention it to me. And I just want to say, when we came to the Dominican Republic, we knew no one. And, uh, of course, we knew some of the people in the industry. As a matter of fact, some of our neighbors came from Tampa. They ran big companies and they were here and they were neighbors and everything, but everyone was basically told, my, everybody basically told my father, no, you, everybody's on their own. You do what you think. If my father in the beginning went to other manufacturers, there weren't many, it was only about two or three here at that time, to see what the, how the pay scale was, not to disrupt anything, how things are done here. And everybody said, no, you do whatever you want. Everybody does their own thing. And the one that opened the doors to us, and it's always been there, was Don Fernando Leon. Don Fernando Leon was a god, it, or I think he would be considered a godfather of Dominican tobacco. Uh, he was always known and respected and famed for knowing every region, every seed, every tobacco. But his legacy, and I think his reputation, is that he was an, a man. He was a man of an impeccable integrity and reputation. He was a man that not many people got close to. But if he felt if he felt that you you earned it, you were on the inside. That's I went to Don Fernando Leon many times when we had problems that I never faced before in Dominican Republic, and he was always there to open his door, bring me to his office, and give me father fatherly advice. 38, 39, almost 40 years ago, and that you know you don't forget. I'm very grateful, and Don Fernando Leon is definitely someone that should not be forgotten. And for what his contribution, what he did for the Dominican Republic, when no one was here. Very true. Very, very true. Okay. Um, one last segment um, we're going to do. Um, and this is what we call our one must go segment. Um, so you guys haven't done this before. Um, and I just want to mention that the one must go segment 
Um, it is sponsored by United Cigars. United, we smoke, but one must go. Brought to you by United Cigars, featuring La Diana Havana, distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron. Buy United, smoke United, live United. Here's what we do in this segment, guys. We're going to put three things on the board, okay, um, that are all, they'll all have something in common. And one of these has to kind of go away forever. You have to eliminate one of these th- three things. Um, Bear, do we want to do the one I put in, or did you have an audible you want to do? No, this one's good. Okay. It's, tis so the season, man. Tis the season. So this is Christmas time, okay? This is Christmas time. This is not a cigar-related question so, here. What okay. do we win? What do uh, we win? Um, a bobblehead. <laughs> a bobblehead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, where's Carlito bobblehead? <laughs> All right. Uh, there's no winners or losers here, actually. Um, but we have three things related to the Christmas season. And of these three things, and they're popular things, but one of them has to go away forever, in your opinion. Here are the th- – and we'll, Bear and I will play along with this too, so we won't put you too much on the spot. So there are three Christmas traditions that we have uh, – that we see every year. Christmas cookies, Christmas lights, and Christmas trees. One of those has to go away forever. Eliminate it. Which is the one you're going to give up? Shit, everybody knows that I love sweets like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't give up the lights and you can't give up the tree. I mean, I would be crucified by Emma and Jasper. So I'll do a sacrifice <laughs> and get rid of the cookies. <laughs> I agree. The cookies. Oh, the cookies. 2-2-0 two, two and oh with the cookies. Taking okay. one for the team, Jose. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right, Bear. What about you? Oh well, this is this is a this is a great topic because I think you know I think the holidays you know are, they represent so many different things to so many people and that there's like always these time honored traditions of everything that uh, they kind of um, are interwoven in, in every family and I think these what well, you did a great job here, Coop, was picking three things that really have a place in like you know ninety nine percent of the people you know. Uh, 99% of the Christmas celebrating families and everything. But uh, I, I think it's a, it's an easy call for me too. Um, there, you know, I, my memories of Christmas tree decorating are, are actually probably not as romantic or as wonderful um, as most people. My older sister always decorated the tree and, and I, I would try to help her. And I learned very early on that uh, I should just let her do it because she would always take the ornaments that I would hang up and she would put them in the back because she didn't like the ornaments that I hung up or where that I would hang them. And so I, I, you know, very early on in my young, this sounds sad and depressing, but I got, but I got so much joy out of watching her decorate our tree. Uh, and it was always beautiful. She always did a terrific job. And, and, uh, and so it was always, it was always wonderful to watch that. And I, I loved having uh, the same tree, the same decorations always placed perfectly because my sister's a perfectionist. And, um, you know, the light, lights are, have a really great memory, too, because like, you know, I grew up in a family. We didn't have a lot of money uh, growing up. And one of one of our favorite things to do during the holiday season is 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 go look, go drive around and look at the Christmas lights, you know, and uh, we have this wonderful neighborhood. You know, now there's neighborhoods. It's really uh, it's really weird to me. There's there's these neighborhoods in the Dallas Fort Worth area that I'm familiar with that they actually charge money to get into these neighborhoods to see to see Christmas lights and. When I grew up in El Paso, Texas, there was this one neighborhood called Eastridge, um, and uh, they never charged for it, but it was it was always packed, always packed, and they uh, every every house decked to the nines. I mean, just unbelievable, and those were some of the most fond memories as a child. Uh, you can't get rid of lights. This is an easy call for me. The cookies got to go. Um, those are just those are two wonderful moments that you just can't get back. Uh, too many memories, too many good times with Christmas trees, Christmas lights. Uh, the cookies got to go. I got my new cookie right here. I'm good. We're solid. Here you go. There's always got to be a dissenting vote here, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's me. So I'll make it really easy. Um, you know, the Christmas lights are going, and, and there's a reason why. So <laughs> growing up, okay, let me just tell, I'll, tell, I'll kind of tell the story a bit. My dad, my dad is Jewish, okay? So he did not celebrate Christmas uh, growing up. But when he married my mom, he got really into Christmas, right? So he, he, and one of the things he started really getting into was Christmas lights on the house. And he became one of these competitive guys that he was trying to outdo the neighbors. 
And every year I'd have to get up there and put those freaking lights on the house. And it was torture. <laughs> and I, I said, when I get married, I'm never doing that because I just, it was, it was, believe me, <laughs> he'd come up with this elaborate thing every year. So I'm sorry, the Christmas lights are going. <laughs> I just, uh, th- those, I did nightmares yeah, yeah. of being on the roof and, as a 16 year old and stuff with that. Oh, it was painful. <sighs> so the Christmas lights are going for that reason. <laughs> That was one of the f- most fun things for me as a child. That was like, that's when I became a man. But my dad, was when my, my dad, dad would t- let me, my dad would let me decorate the house, get on the roof and hang up the lights. That was, he went that was too such far. A- he went too far. My dad. I mean, he just went way overboard with this, right? It, it just got to be, it didn't get to be fun anymore because every year he's <laughs> trying to out. And it was a competition. We, we lived in Staten Island. But at that point we were out of Brooklyn. We were in Staten Island and it, that was, he was trying to be one, one of these guys to have the elaborate display. So, yeah, Coop, my goodness, imagine you're trying to get on top of the antenna because your father wanted to make sure the light or the little star was on top of the antenna. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Let me tell you the, oh, the, let me start with the, the cable. The, when cable TV came, that was the best thing in the world with those. He was always buying new TV antennas. Oh, yeah. oh, oh my. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, that was so. Yeah, it's it, that's why it's I look, it's does I not that I don't like Christmas lights, but I can live without them after after going through what I had to go through growing that's up. Cool. Yeah, that's so, beautiful. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah. All right, Bear, do we have anything else for Carlito and Jose here? Uh, no, that was uh, that was great. Christmas yeah. cookies got to go. I love it. <laughs> there you go. So we got um, the three and the lights. Who's gonna win? We did. Standing. I guess the lights win. The lights, the lights would have, not the lights, the, the cookies would have won that one, right? Or are we picking a winner of the three? Like, what's the bet? Like, what's the best out of all three? Like, it's like a reverse of one must go, like, instead of like, which one are you uh, kicking the, out? Like, the cookies went, one light went, but we still got three trees. Boy, I tell you, so here's you what happened with have, it. You can't, you can't have Christmas without a tree. Yeah. yeah, I tell yeah. you, Jose. This is where this is where this is where I believe. I I thought the same thing because there's nothing like the smell of pine in Christmas. Growing up, I smell the pine, the flannel shirts, waiting for the choo choo train, the toys on the Christmas tree, Christmas Eve. But I tell you one thing: living 40 years in the third world, I have seen so much happiness where there's nothing. I see people decorating telephone poles with lights. I see people, branches of dead trees decorating with lights. And you can have Christmas without a tree, but you really, the lights I think are the most important thing of any Christmas. And living here in the Dominican Republic and seeing how they use lights and they put it in the crossing the streets on tents, it doesn't, you know, they don't have pine trees. Not everybody can afford one. That's or, true. You know, it's available, yet they have their Christmas. You know, Carlito, so it, that's a good pick. That's a good, that's a good angle. You know, I remember when I went to Miami once during Christmas time, and I saw the palm trees with Christmas lights, and it was yes. wow. It's, 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 and we'd never seen that in the Northeast. And I'm, I'm in Miami. I'm seeing all these uh, these palm trees, and I'm like, wow, this is that. <laughs> I can see. Yeah, I, I understand well, where you're coming from. Miami, you go to a gas station and the guy filling, you know, working at the gas station has a cigar with Christmas lights pumping gas. Yeah. So <laughs> that's Miami. Mm. He has Christmas lights on their cigar. Well, yeah. to be honest, here in Scorpio, it's uh, no, no, I mean, we have a pine tree and that thing, that in the house. But to be honest, what you see is all over every street and, and, and the square where Alexander the Great monuments are, it's all lights, lights, lights. So I, I guess it's, I was mistaken. At the end of the day, it's lights, lights over everything. I can understand that. I, like I said, you guys are get, making me rethink. I'll, I'll say if I don't have to put up the lights, I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna say how bad do you feel now, Coop, after that wonderful, that wonderful story. I, no, I'll, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll say my answer. As long as I don't have to put the lights up, that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, but Will, Will, at least you're not telling the story how you fell off the roof, you know? Right, right. <laughs> All tangled up. Oh, in these splinters. Lights. I got splinters and stuff. Oh, it was... <laughs> Lucky we oh, had God. a one-story family house, is what I'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Great, great. All right. All right. 
Anything hey, else, Coop and I, uh, Bear? I mean, I'm, uh, it's not that I want to leave, but uh, no, no, I think we hit everything we wanted the ducks, to hit. The ducks, Jose, you know. <laughs> no, the, the ducks are still 30 more minutes. It's dark yeah. here. It's still dark. I, I yeah. won't throw out the bread and all the stuff we give them till it's a light. Yeah. I want to say one last thing. Uh, it's been really good because, to be honest, even though every Sunday, Carlito, myself, and Jeremiah are on the show, and sometimes Cynthia, but just being Carlito and I one on one, and that's when I talk to uh, to Coop. And I, and to be honest, I asked Liana first. I said, "What do you think about this?" She said, "Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great idea." And even though Carlito and I've been friends for many years, now in the last nine months, we've been uh, very close, and we talk about a lot of things. But we talk about history a lot. And uh, one thing I want to say tonight, because I think it's interesting for people to, uh, to understand how much the industry has changed. Because I knew about this, but tonight I wanted to confirm it with two people because I do like you guys do, Coop, and you're very good at that. You go to the source. So I asked Benji tonight, because Ernie had told me in the past, and Carlito had told me. No, you, you asked me first. You asked me first, and I didn't remember. I knew the name when no, I was No, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that, because still, we, we have to do some investigation. I'm going to call our friend, you know, uh, the guy uh, for February to confirm <laughs> this. But listen, listen to this. Today, depending on the factory, let's say you have 100 rollers. Some factories, for every 15 rollers, they have a supervisor. Some people are every 10. Some, some factories, I know it's 12 to 1. But talking to Benji tonight, he said at one time they had 250 rollers at H. Huffman. We're not talking at Monte Cristo or Pola wow. Rañaga. They had one guy in charge. It's called Capataz. And they had an assistant. So between two people where the rolling room was, would, was handled, and look at today, all the things we have. So I was like blown away with that. And we got to go back to the days where Cuban cigars were made with aged tobacco, three, four years, where rollers were making cigars that would draw perfectly, that were, you know, top out there. And look at today, all how much the industry has changed. So that's something I just, I'm throwing out there because we're trying to do a, to try to recall all these things, to have them at least on, on, on shows and uh, all these things we're doing for people to, to really understand how much the injury has changed. And maybe next year, Coop, Carlito and I could be on the show again and just talk through all the different changes that we have seen in the industry. Like there's still theories about some people use wooden molds, other people, other people use plastic molds. There's different things. There's so much things out there that, uh, that I think it's our, I'm not gonna say it's our obligation, but I think it's good that we are throwing these things that we have learned through times. And Carlito, I mean, I've known a lot of people, but Carlito knew all the big names out there, the people, the Angels Olivas, uh, the, the, what's the Angels uh, Olivas, the brother Chucho Oliva, and all these people, the people was uh, Bermejo, Simon Camacho, all these people that we just have to talk about this. So, uh, I don't know what Carlito has to say about this, but to me, I, it's mind blowing in my opinion. Yeah, you know, those are my mentors. Those are professors. And, and I see today where we're at, without them, we wouldn't be here, none of us. Uh, they are the foundation, the pillars of history and everything. They were the pioneers, you know, after that, that, that were able to transform the industry from being strictly Cuba or Tampa, because you got to think of Tampa, because Tampa at one time made 500 million cigars of Cuban tobacco. And as Benji said in our show, Benjamin Menendez, that when he was young, his colleagues and he, they used to send him to Tampa to see what's going on because Tampa were the innovators in Tampa. Tampa was amazing. But also I remember that it was always that way. You have one foreman, one capataz, and you had an assistant. The cigar makers, that, that they were so proud that they would not put a cigar in that half wheel, the 50 cigars that we count, the Mega Reda, 
unless it was perfect. Because if a selector would pull it out and everything, it was an insult and embarrassment. And there may have been a fist fight that afternoon in a parking lot or wherever they got. That, that was, it was an era where it, it just was incredible. But that's what I remember. That's the way I was taught. And even though history might seem, people seem to exaggerate things and everything, but I do remember it was that way. But I asked myself also, is it also that cigars were not that perfect back then? That they were 25 cents or 15 or or two for 55 and a little indentation here or a head that wasn't right or whatever it was, it really wasn't something that people were fine tuning on and so forth because they were brand smokers. And if they, they bought a box of cigars and it was X brand, that's what they smoked five a day because of a different world. Today, a cigar costs you five, 10, 15, $20. You have so much information. People are so critical. There's, there's two sides that I look at that. But yes, it's true. But I'm sure there was, I see cigars pre-embargo and so forth. And I understand when you look at them and they're squared, but you look at a cigar when it's squared and you see indentations and everything all over the cigar. And you know, that cigar had a lot of bumps and indentation and it was squared to remove all the defects. But Things have changed. Now there's no room for imperfections because consumers are very sophisticated and cigars are not, I mean, I really look at things and try to look at both both ways, but uh, it was a different world. And I really think that it's very, very important that that world be remembered because we could always, we always could learn from the past. And I think that those were the glory days of the cigar industry. Maybe because I didn't live them, but I heard about them. And the person that always told me about those glory days, you know, they always romanticize. So I think that maybe it's the same thing that I, I would do when I do every day of my life, because that's what I was taught. But I think the best days in the cigar industry, honestly, I really believe it, are here today. I really believe that. I think the best cigars are being made, not by two companies, five, but by, by 30 companies are making the best cigars, making great cigars. And, there's no room for error anymore. That the consumer is very sophisticated. Thanks to programs like this tonight, thanks to the critics, thanks to the journalists, thanks to people being able to share opinions. And I think that that only, of course, I lose, I lose sleep at night, but that keeps us all on the edge to make sure that we do the best humanly possible. We could do no more than just do the best humanly possible. And that is our goal day to day. So. I can't think about the past other than remember it. And I really think that, um, I think the best cigars in there today, I really do. I do so. Very, I do. Well, very well said. Very yeah. well said. Um, and like I said, I agree. You know, we've talked about it too. The, I think it's these shows with the his, history and putting them on there. It's providing a unique opportunity and a unique mm -hmm. experience that, you know, like I said, 10 years ago, we didn't have this. And, uh, you know, it's very important that we, you know, preserve it. And all the shows bring a different uh, angle to it, which I think is really good. And the stories, you know, it's, it's just so much to tell. And, and, and like I said, we, we like, all of us love doing these shows. We don't make a lot of money on these shows, but we we love doing it. It's, it's something we all look forward to every week. Or sometimes more than once a week. Um, I want to just mention, I mean, I know it's a busy weekend for Jose. Um, I know you guys have a Meet the Professor show on Sunday. I just want to uh, give you guys a chance. Who do you guys have on Meet the Professor? Thank you. <laughs> we have a Are you very... laughing because of the great personality we have and you don't know what to expect? <laughs> no, no, I'm always excited about... about... Oh, I'm talking about Jose. Jose's laughing. We have probably one of the industry's greatest characters. Okay. Our good friend, Artol, he's been in the business for many, many years. He has a great story and uh, he has right now 14 shops and he's still not stopping there. His last two shops were uh, are run by a very good friend of ours, George Sosa. They did some uh, 
partnership in, in Florida. And Abe is, uh, I would just describe, he's a character, a good friend, passionate. He's done a lot of things in his life, but uh, his last, I don't know, 20, 25 years have been dedicated to the, uh, to the industry. And he told me, uh, precisely talking with him yesterday, that uh, he still has not stopped uh, looking at shops to buy. So uh, he's looking at least for 2021, at least to add three or four more shops. So that's gonna be interesting. He has a different perspective than <clears throat> other retailers at the show, but I, uh, I invite people uh, to tune in. We, uh, one of the things that we decided is to bring in different people, retailers, uh, some people uh, from the press, uh, manufacturers, but there's one thing that we do. It's all people, family related. I've always believed in the brick and mortars. Carlitos and Don Carlos and Don, Don Arturo believe in them. Our philosophy is uh, to support brick and mortar, be close to consumers. Every single day, try to do our best, be creative, but be creative the things that really make sense, that are gonna be uh, appealing to consumer. So I don't know what Carlitos coming out with because I haven't had the kings, I haven't had the paints, I haven't had anything. Sometimes I think I'm on a blacklist with Carlito. I'm just sometimes on Monday waiting for a pink slip or a call from, <laughs> from maybe Karen or maybe Liana because she's nice to me. Oh, I'll say, you know what, Daddy decided this. So uh, I don't know. I think the, lo the, the love has been lost. But uh, I will probably see him in uh, January, God willing. And maybe, maybe I'll get to smoke one or two pinks and maybe a king. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Maybe stop taking the cigars out of his pocket, Jose, and maybe he'll yeah, like yeah exactly, exactly. Oh, uh, exactly. So that's awesome. We'll look forward to that. And then, Jose, you're doing a show with a, a newer media brand that I think people should be paying attention to. They've, they've become friends of mine, uh, Matt and Nicole on Smoking Tobacco on Saturday at 4 p.m. Yes, Eastern. I'm going to start to promote it tomorrow. Uh, yep. I've heard a lot of good things about them. I'm going to, it's going to be 10 o'clock my time. Yep. It's going to be four o'clock his time. Uh, from what I've heard, he's upcoming. He's very, uh, very professional. And I look forward to uh, interact with, uh, with him. Uh, and of course, uh, Carney will be on the show too, that works with Lito. And some yep. people ask me, well, you, you're going to have a competitor on the show. And I said, I don't see John Carney as a competitor. And we had Lito on our show. And yep. Lito is one of Carlito's best friends, my best friend. And to be honest, Lito has done so much for the industry. And is one of those people that has dedicated money yep. and his time to the CRA. I mean, we didn't have time to talk about this, but I can tell you something. Uh, I have the utmost respect for, for, for Lito, for Tony, his son, for, for the Newmans, for the Padrones, and four or five other people that have done all the legwork with this. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, we're all one. But if, if we do not unite, you know, we could all be in trouble in the future. And it's the same with us with media folks too. And uh, you know, we there's like I said, we always look for good new media folks to come up. I've been I've gotten to know them. Uh, I actually did uh, Matt's birth. Matt had a little birthday herf, and I was part. Of, yeah, I was honored to be a part of that. Um, I like what they're doing. Um, they bring the funny thing is uh, he is uh, younger than my oldest daughter. So, <laughs> uh, but for what he's done, he's had some nice guests on over. He's had some big name guests already. I mean, he's had on. Um, Nick Perdomo, Glenn Loop. So he's he's doing some really good things. So I think you'll have a great experience, Jose, with that as well. And I, I want to say something. And, uh, you know, if you look at what the guys that are doing great jobs with the media, because there was a time where we had 30, 40, 50, 60 people with blogs and all that, they have mostly all disappeared. And you ask yourself, why did they disappear? I'm not going to mention the bad things that some of them did, but at the end of the day, it's you, you have to travel. You have to interact with, yep. the, with the players. You, you got to learn about it. You could not just, you know, do a blog just sitting in your office because you went to a store and, and bought a $6 cigar and all of a sudden think you are, you know, you're a professional uh, 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 smoker or a blogger. You have to interact and really learn. Look at, Look at your traveling and, you know, other guys that have been successful in the media. You really have to go to the farms and the factories and see how things are going. It's, you can't be watching videos or hearing opinions to other people. So 
uh, I'm glad when you know young people are coming up and upcoming people and doing a great job because we need the media because at the end of the day, you guys, uh, uh, one way or the other, connect us with thousands and thousands of, uh, of consumers all over the world. How many people have Carlito, myself, and Jeremiah met over these nine months of period doing our show and other shows that we've been on? So it's, it's been a blessing, and, and uh, we're enjoying every moment of it. We appreciate it as well. I mean, thank you so much um, for taking the time. I mean, like I said, this was a last minute thing. I hope we did well because we had, we had a prep pretty quickly and uh, you know, we always, uh, but I, I, but it was, I, I couldn't ask for anything more. This was very generous of you guys. Uh, yes. We love you. We love you guys. Um, and yeah, Jose, we're going to take you up on that show next year, by the way, where we look back at that. So you can count on that. Great idea. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you yeah. so much. Well, thank, thank you very much, Bear. Thank you, Coop. Uh, I will. I really appreciate it. You know, but to me, this was just a, uh, Sitting around a table, it's hard to believe we're so far apart. I'm here in the Caribbean at DR, and, and you guys in States and Jose on the other side of the world. But I feel that it's just, you know, friends getting together and having a family conversation. I just hope that the listeners appreciate it, they list, that they enjoyed it, and, and we were able to contribute something for the time that they, they were able to devote to us. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, and it was very special for me. It's same it's here. Ab absolutely same here. This was very, very unique. So thank you, guys. Um, Merry Christmas, Jose. I know we'll be talking as well. Um, uh, Merry so Christmas. Happy Hanukkah and all the best to everybody. Yep. All and, right. And, and whatever you do, be, don't climb on the roof. Be careful with the lights when you're putting up. The Absol <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. If dad makes you climb up there, tell him you want some safety uh, precautions. <laughs> exactly. Uh, right, bear, hey. Coop Bear, thanks, Merry thanks for Christmas. the opportunity. Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, be safe. Coop and I will probably talk before the end of the year 30 or 40 more times. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Bear, always great to see you, brother. And, uh, <laughs> Keep up the great work and uh, the best of both of you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Jose, go, go, go feed the ducks. <laughs> and, and, and no, it's still dark. I don't know why. It's it's going to be maybe 6 They're going to have breakfast at 6.30. So don't worry. The bread and everything is here. I, I'm going to try to go to sleep. So I don't want to worry anymore. You 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 assure me you're going to go feed the ducks, okay? We'll, we'll yes, have a full, yes, we'll have yes, a full yes, report from Jose on that. Absolutely. Hey, everybody, be well. Have a great evening. Take care, guys. Have a good day. Merry good Christmas. Night. Merry I'll Christmas, gentlemen. Night. Thank you so much. All right. Good night, Carlito, everyone. Good night. That's Carlito Fuente and Jose Blanco on Primetime Special Edition here. Um, and with that, um, we have some more things to do. Um, we have a contest, actually. Um, and uh, it's another Monte Cristo 1935 giveaway. And if you uh, missed last week's show, Primetime Special Edition 89, uh, we had Raphael Nodell and Jennifer True on. They, we, we did the launch of the uh, Monte Cristo 1935. And we did the launch. I mean, we were the first yeah. ones to do that. Um, and they had, they had a special giveaway. And they've given us one more of these giveaways to give away. Um, oh, and, that's awesome. Yep. So here's what you get. Um, you get um, a nice swag kit that includes a leather journal, complete with a, uh, a pen, a square pen, because the Monte Cristo 1935 is box pressed, right? So you get that. You're going to get, um, because this cigar, they're going to be doing some stuff with coffee. And if you heard the show, you know, there's been a lot of pairings with the coffee. You get a sample of twin engine coffee. Great coffee. Uh, this was a blend that they actually did for the Monte Cristo 1935 anniversary. So you'll get Beautiful. that. You will get a, um, a Lotus cutter. Beautiful Lotus cutter. So you'll get that as well um you definitely want that and you'll get a uh a leather a leather wallet with the money clip and i think mm -hmm. there's a three finger case in there too that i don't have but I, they said that on there as well so the question is very simple i'm gonna very simple question who was the person in nicaragua that contributed to the blend and producing the monte cristo 1935 blend Okay, before everyone starts answering, 
you're going to have to do a couple of, there's a couple of rules to abide by. So yep. Koopa, you're thinking of the hashtag. I'm going to go ahead and go over the rules. So the person who contributed to the blend who's in Nicaragua contributed to the blend of the Monte Cristo 1935. You're going to put the person's name in the chat, but along with that chat, it has to be on the cigar coupe page. So if you're looking at, if you're viewing this video on a watch party um, I shared it on a couple of different pages. If you're viewing it on a shared page, go to the Cigar Coop Facebook page. Look at the video that we're still doing live right now. You're going to want to comment in the chat. Put the person's name from Nicaragua that contributed to the, the Monte Cristo 1935 blend. And you're going to hashtag it with Coop. Monte Cristo 1935. And here's hashtag, the thing. Hashtag Monte Cristo 1935. And... Go to Google if you want to get the answer. Or go to Cigar Coop and you can go Mighty Crystal 1935. Um, but we'll put that out there. I know the contest went a little later tonight, uh, but we had a very unique opportunity there. So, uh, again, uh, who in, in, in the, on Nicaragua contributed to the blend of the Monte Cristo 1935? Uh, hashtag it on the Cigar Coop page, the live stream page. Hashtag Monte Cristo 1935. And you, uh, I will pick one winner at random after the show. And last week's winner was Jeff Walsh, by the way. So, um, oh, fantastic! Yep, Jeff he Walsh was one of the first people to answer that question. And so it, cool. it came out good. Yep. So Jeff's, uh, and they're, they'll get that right out to you as well. So we're very fortunate to get another. This is one of the better kits. We've had some great stuff from our friends at uh, at uh, Tobacco Area USA with that, and uh, we smoked that cigar, by the way. I loved it. I was in love with that cigar. So, uh, uh, very good. Really good. It's really good. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I went back and smoked that Churchill and it's great too. Wasn't so. it fantastic? That's what I smoked that night. Oh man. It was so good. Yeah. I smoked the number two that night, but the Churchill, uh, both great cigars. Um, so definitely do that as well. And, you know, as always, you know, that's brought to you, um, by our friends at tobacco or USA. Uh, makers of iconic brands such as Monte Cristo, Romeo Julieta, H. Upman, and Aging Room Cigars. Tobacco Larry say great things are happening here. So we're getting actually we have our, our great things are happening here segment now as well. Um, and uh, just want to mention these are stories that are meant to be the uplifting stories. We hear a lot of negatives and um, we have some positive. We always like to pick one, Barry and I each pick a positive story that we've seen uh, in uh, you know the headlines or the news. Uh, recently. So, uh, Bear, I'll, I'll turn this one over to you first. So, so I came across this story and, uh, it, oh man, it, it, it's one of those, it's one of those almost like those tear jerkers. Um, you know, they, they, they say, and in the article, they even quote their, their, the, the famous quote that there's no place like home for the holidays. Right. And we, we just talked about some Christmas traditions with our illustrious guests just a few moments ago. And, and, and Christmas has a, has a very, you know, it's a wonderful time for a lot of folks and and but it's you know it can also be really difficult you know if you're not able to be at home with your family or if you're not able if you you know you know not everyone is as fortunate as you and I coop and so um, this is a story about uh, two uh, small business owners uh, for a, a print shop in Ireland Patricia and Tony Walsh okay and they have they employ about 120 people and so they, they, they started, they, they started kind of putting together this plan um, um, in this particular area that they, that they have a business in housing options are both limited and they're actually very, very expensive. So most of their employees actually can't afford to, to live in, uh, in the area in which they work. So, um, so they had two longtime workers that had worked with them and uh, who've been uh, with the Walsh since uh, immigrating to Ireland from Poland 16 years ago. And they were actually faced with the possibility of having to be evicted. So without home. And this was brought to the attention of the business owners. And so the husband and wife team answered uh, in the way that seems obvious and fitting for the season, right? So they offered affordable housing alternative as an incentive to keep their employees in the family fold. So, so this is, in, so this was back a few years ago. So in 2017, the, the couple actually started planning to uh, permission to build tracks of uh, not-for-profit homes on land already owned by the Walsh company, right? So there's 70 units, 
70 units in this building that they built specifically uh, in honor and for their employees, 20 of which have actually been already earmarked for the com for company workers. So the it's the entire project is non for profit non for profit it's a thousand square foot uh, attached homes are sold to employees at about 30,000 pounds. So think about that that's about $36,000. Think about what you paid for your home if you're if you actually are a, a homeowner here in the United States. Wow, yeah. $36,000 then that's that's really below market value. So to like so offset costs the other 50 units are set to be sold at full value, right? So that they can offer this extent to you know this this uh, this basic this terrific discount to other families. So, so with the construction of these new homes now completed, the the particular the first family um, was the first to move into their new home, and they've already began you know decorating and making it their own. And it's this is just a terrific story. You know, it's 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 you know you know I've had the good fortune of working for some really great people over the last few years, and my my employees, my employers rather, excuse me, um, have really taught me a lot about leadership and they've taught me a lot about, um, accepting people for who they are. And they've taught a lot, me, they've taught a lot about doing, you know, you know, a lot with actions and these, uh, the Walsh's are certainly just a, a, an exemplary example of that. And so, uh, during this holiday season, what a better way, what a better way to uplift your spirits that knowing that there's 20 families that work for the Walsh's um, and more families to come that will be occupying this place that was built in inspiration for their employees. What can you say? That's just beautiful. That's a beautiful story. It, yeah. It, 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 yeah and Seriously, it, just, it, tugs, it tugs at the heartstrings, man. It really does. It does. It really does. And like I said, we hear about all this nonsense in the news and, you know, the gossip and, you know, the the hate news and all that. And you get something like this. It's, that's a great story. Okay. So my story is about a woman by the name of Priscilla Boyle, who just celebrated her birthday on November 22nd. And she's from the state of Arkansas. And she even got a, uh, a birthday message um, from the governor of Ar Arkansas, H Asa Hutchinson. Um, the following couple of days later at his press briefing. Um, what, what is significant about this is the, the woman actually was in the hospital for a month contracting COVID. Um, and even over, over the past year, um, she, she's had, you know, over the past few years, she's had pneumonia and cancer she's had to overcome. But here's the catch with all this. Her birthday was our 106th birthday. A hundred, she, she, she lived for 106. She's 106. She lived to celebrate 106th birthday after overcoming all that. Um, and she's had a great uh, contributions over the years. She's taught Sunday school. She owned a beauty shop in Little Rock. Um, and she sat out on her porch uh, on Thanksgiving. And uh, there was a socially distanced celebration. People came by. People drove cars, decorated, um, just to wish her the best there. And um, there's a link in there with some of the pictures of the cars that were decorated. Beautiful story, inspirational story. Our, our centurions in this country, they should be on a pedestal. That you know, I was fortunate enough to have an aunt to live to be 100, so I, I know it's a very special thing. Um, and 106, and what a year she had to overcome that. Um, and uh, happy birthday to Priscilla Boyle a little late. Happy birthday. Absolutely. Yeah. Jose's calling. 106. Mate. Jose, the show's, I was still say, Jose's calling. Jose, the show's still going on. <laughs> Sorry, Jose. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. Uh, happy birthday. Great one, things are happening here. Great, great oh, thing, my goodness. Great things are happening here. And then I'll just kind of one more time, just if you haven't, if you tuned in later or missed it again, you can get in on the contest. Uh, tell me who uh, in Nicaragua contributed to the blend of the Monte Cristo 1935 on the Cigar Coop page, hashtag it, hashtag Monte Cristo 1935. And uh, you have to do that. Uh, the otherwise, I can't find the comments. And it's, it's right. getting very, very harder as well. Um, so, uh, and there are some wrong answers. <laughs> there are some right answers and some wrong answers is what I'll say. All right, because it's Nicaragua. All right. 
Um, Bear, uh, let me just kind of do, I'll do a few reads here. Sounds good. I need to take a quick break. Okay, so I'll kind of go through the reads. I want to mention uh, our sponsor, uh, JRE Tobacco. The, oh, I'm sorry, JRE Tobacco. The authentic coral leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it was one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the from Valley in Honduras, Julio Arroyo took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he successfully reintroduced authentic Corojo to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the JRE Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corojo. Now with JRE Tobacco, they bring you the Aladino line. Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Corojo Puro, San Andreas Maduro, Ecuadorian Connecticut Shade, Cameroon, or Habano wrapper, representing the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. It's now available at your local retailer. Be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And of course, I want to mention Illusioni Cigars. Deep in flavor, deep in your mind. We're not industry standard. Illusioni Cigars. And finally, our friends at Michael's Tobacco. With just over a decade of ownership, Michael's Tobacco has been able to become the premier tobacconist in the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area and cigar patrons the world over. With two convenient locations in Euless, just a quick jump from the DFW airport in Keller, Texas, Michael's Tobacco stands as a beacon for the Texas cigar retailers. Michael's was the very first cigar lounge in the state of Texas to add a bar to its ever-growing accommodations. Proprietor Mike Peacock is a former IPCBR board member and now has made Michael's a family affair by having his son Bob join the ownership force. Under general manager and master storyteller Tracy Spence's leadership at Michael's, his self-proclaimed accomplishment has been assembling, quote, the greatest team in cigar retail business, unquote, as well as building some of the finest relationships with the industry's most respected individuals. Inventory director Jason Fields handles and maintains two of the area's proudest humidors, containing premium cigars for everyone from the everyday smoker to the most ardent collector of rare puros. Under Mike, Bob, Tracy, and Jason's example, they've listed a staff of Kevin, Austin, Bear, Joe, Silas, and Brandon that collectively boast over 100 years of combined industry experience. Together, they have brought a true and blessed mainstay to their respective communities. Whether you're celebrating an anniversary, birthday, hole in one, or just a desire to relax, Michael's Tobacco will have the perfect cigar waiting with an exquisite beverage family and lively conversation. Visit michaelstobacco.com for more details on a calendar of upcoming events. Michael's Tobacco, not just a cigar shop, but the perfect blend of Texas hospitality and the days of yore. We are back on a uh, primetime special edition. Bear is back with us. So we, we got the, uh, we got the lights uh, paid. Lights were being kept on. We got everything done there. Uh, and Bear, and I have a few miscellaneous topics we want to go to, but Bear, I mean, I don't know what else we could say that, that what we just heard over the, uh, of, you know, this was a, these, like I said, these are the two, this has got to be the, the two greatest pinch hitters we ever had. Um, they volunteered to do this. I want to make this really clear. That, you know, when Liana couldn't do the show, the first thing is we want to make sure everything's okay with her personally, and we'll get her rescheduled. That's not a problem with that. Um, we were going to do a show no matter what. Um, they came to us with this, offering to do this. And how do you, you know, I, I can't express um, the generosity that they did to do that tonight. Um, yes, I mean, it... it, it... It, it really meant a lot uh, to, I mean, it really meant a lot to, to us, you know, to, to be able to, you know, offer some incredible, you know, incredible, I mean, the, the, the best pinch hitting, you know, experience uh, for our audience. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable to have those. I mean, we just, I mean, we just had Carlito on the show a month ago and we were able to talk about some stuff that we weren't able to hit on the previous night. It was a different, different I would vibe. say it's a different, it was a different vibe and we were able to bring out, uh, even an, an even a different side of him, I would think, and and it was it was a really great opportunity. Again, uh, best wishes uh, to Liana and you know what she's going through right now, and uh, we we definitely want to want to send all of our best wishes to her during this time and everything, and and uh, we're excited to have her on uh, when that time comes, and we'll get her rescheduled. Won't be a problem, but it would um, for them to vol- for these two gentlemen to volunteer, Jose halfway around the world. Carlito with his incredibly busy schedule uh, to come on again so soon um, at a moment's notice. I mean, I, sincerely, I mean, and thank you. Just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do yeah. a service, but no, it, we were very, very grateful. No, we really were. We really were. They did not have to do that by any means. Uh, and, and it's part of what, you know, 
things happen when you have a guest and, and part of what we do is, you know, we do this, it's on people's personal time. Um, but they mm-hmm. have personal lives. Um, so we are very, we, we don't take that for granted by any means. We, we, uh, we take that very seriously. Um, and, uh, for them, like I said, and like I said, we had a whole different vibe with this. Aaron and I are going to have Jose on in late January, like to talk about his experiences at Fuente. So, you know, we didn't want to cut that done. But certainly I knew Matt Tobacco was doing the show on Saturday. I didn't want to cut into that thunder either. So I was sensitive to those types of things. Uh, we were, you know, we had, a, you know, we had an offer there. We, we, we definitely just tried to do it a little differently. Uh, we kind of put this, we had to put this show together. I mean, Jose called me probably, it was like three, three, three thirty my time. Um, and I had to call bear just kind of, you know, see, you know, see if we could do this. Uh, we got it scheduled and we, we just had to kind of put some sort of structure together and hopefully it went, I think it went well. Our audience will be the final judge of that. Cause I think, it, I, like I said, I don't think, I don't think they've ever done a show together outside of meet the professor. No, I don't think so. I don't, they may have done a couple of herfs or something like that. I, I get that. But you know, like I said, we, uh, we kind of have our, uh, our model for the show and uh, it was, I'm blown away. I was just blown away to have like, these two legends to, to do this for us. Um, I, I, you know, this, I, w- we've gotten an opportunity to have several members of the Fuente family and the Fuente company on uh, over the past few months. And uh, one thing that's very clear, Bear, is there is no shortage of information out there. Uh, there's always something to talk about with that. And we could have probably went, I didn't want to go four hours with Carlito again. I couldn't do that to him. So uh, they were very <laughs> generous with their time. Jose got up in the middle of the night. I mean, so I don't know what else we could say. He says, thank you to both of them very much. I mean, did you ever think we would have two interviews with Carlito and all these, you know, it's just things just, it's just, we, we are grateful for the opportunity. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was an incredible opportunity. Um, it, it, like I said, it was just a different side of him than I think that he's even portrayed on his own show and everything. There was just a lot, uh, a lot to, a lot to chat with him about. I mean, when when someone has given their entire life to to an industry, to a craft, to um, you know, it's given his life. I mean, there's just so. I mean, the four hours that we had with him initially, the two hours tonight. I mean, we're still scratching the surface of, of the the experience and the the you know, the stories that he can leave. And I think Jose, you know, uh, left something really great on the table for us for next year. I think that's a great opportunity to sit down and talk to them about how, you know, the things that have changed. I think that's a great topic. I think that's something that could really bring our audience. I know that's got a lot of our audience excited and it's got me excited. I'm already nerding out about it. Um, thinking about questions that I would ask them. Um, so it's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to, to have that for sure. I totally, I totally agree with you on that. Um, so we want to get thank them, thank our audience for tuning in. Uh, like I said, we had to adjust things, and um, you know that's what we do here. That's that's uh, we're we just like I said, uh, the show must go on. The show must go. Like I said, we were gonna do a show no matter what. We were gonna figure there would there was always a plan B because this could happen, and we always have to be ready. Um, and it's happened a few times to us, not a lot, but there's always a. a, a very, very, it's always, a, it's always been a very good circumstance that would happen. Um, so not good circumstance, but a very valid reason why someone has to pull out. And everyone who we've had on the show has been really good about that um, over the, over the years. So, um, you know, thanks again to them. For sure. Okay. A um, couple, we have a few miscellaneous topics I wanted to hit before we close out the show. Uh, Fire away. We're going to cover. Um, all right. So we're going to kind of end this with some, some interesting discussion points. And I'm going to bring the first one up here. So we have a president-elect right now in Joe Biden. Um, and he's getting ready to assemble his cabinet. And I guess about a week ago, or towards the, uh, this past weekend, um, 
I it was last week. I'm sorry. It was last week. News came out about his pick to head up the Department of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. Very important pick because the FDA falls under the Department of Health and Human Services. Correct. And the pick was a gentleman who's the attorney general of California by the name of Xavier Becerra. Um, and let's just kind of lay it on the table. This is not a pick everyone's happy about if you're in the cigar industry. They shouldn't be happy about it. That's true. Yeah, because uh, uh, Attorney General Becerra has a um, he has a track record of being anti-tobacco. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, so this is where I really want to go with this. Right. I want to obviously talk a little about this pick, but more, you know, but here's the other thing I want to just say, and this is where I want to be a little careful. You know, when Tom Price and Alex Azar, who were the two previous, Alex Azar is the current uh, the secretary of the, of the Department of Health and Human Services. Before that was Tom Price. Um, in particular, the Tom Price pick. People in the industry couldn't wait to laud that pick. Great pick. We look forward to working with, with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, Tom Price, blah, blah, blah. And this time it was crickets, right? I was very disappointed with the crickets I've heard. I, I was willing to give it a little time, but I was disappointed with the crickets. I understand that you don't want to put bad news out there. But I do think our industry owes it to people to create awareness that someone was just someone's coming into this position right now who we and we don't know how much. I mean, he's going to have other things on his plate. COVID, right? I, I, I get that. Mm -hmm. He's going to yeah. have that. It's probably uh, health care, right? But this is not like Alex. A a Alex Azo was a little more of an unknown. We didn't know what, what his position was going to be. This is someone who's got anti-tobacco on them. And I'm disappointed that the industry hasn't created some awareness on that. There's been no statements from any of the trade associations on this. Right. So I, I really, I, I kind of want to, my comment to that is, you guys need to kind of say something on this. Because again, not everyone's reading Coop and Half Wheel on this pick. I so, but yet I go back four years ago. What a difference! I mean, like people couldn't. We're looking forward. Like I think there was a quote: "We were looking forward to working with Tom Price and stuff like that." So, I hope you know. I'll get your thoughts. I've talked on that. Well, I think it's very. I think it's. I, we 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 knew that if a if if joe biden was going to win the election we knew that historically the democratic party has not been in our corner that's a no that's a generalized statement but i think that's i think that's fairly accurate um you know i don't think that's necessarily too bi too biased um because i think that's just something that you know that we've historically seen where um you know the deeming regulations came into effect during a democratic uh, administration right um and you know and so there is, and, and don't and don't get me wrong. Like historically, there have been uh, detrimental acts towards the tobacco industry during Republican administrations. Right. Look at S chip, for example. That was during that was during uh, right. that was during Bush administration. So, um, but I think the thing is to kind of peel back some layers of the onion here and look at uh, uh, Attorney Becerra's uh, nomination and, and and look at some of the core issues that he's that he stood for and campaigned on during his time as an attorney general, and even before that he was actually a congressman as well. Um, I, I want to put a pin in this comment. I'm also I'm trying to actually search for um, his qualification for this position. And I'm not trying to I'm not trying to sling mud at the guy. I'm really not. I, I, but I, I look back and you know you know when you talk, talk about health and human services, you know I mean you, you want someone uh, you would want someone that has some kind of a medical background. Um, and 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 I'm I'm finding it hard to find that that kind of experience uh, from his his uh, his time in public service. You know he represented the the people of the the 33rd uh, 30 I believe the the 33rd congressional district of, um, of California. Yep. Um, 
well actually it's it, it changed time it changed hands a couple of times like i think it was like the 30th went into the 34th district but he was a congressman for uh, 10 years you know so he held office for 10 years uh and then his most recent post is the attorney general uh for california he was preceded obviously by kamala harris um uh, vice president elect and um uh, but since this time in in public office in this position, he's actually uh, he's actually stood on some pretty, you know, key issues uh, during you know that have been kind of around. Now, to it'll, it'll be surprisingly delightful to most tobacconists that uh, that tobacco is not something that he's necessarily put his uh, put out there or something. But one of I mean his primary his primary issue that he stands about is quality and affordable health care. Now, this is a very generalized, you know, you know, very generalized issue. Yes. Well, what does this have to do with tobacco? Well, the the uh, healthcare industry has waged a war on tobacco use for decades. And um, and bringing affordable health care uh, to to the masses also includes making sacrifices to the other. And so and and premiums have gone up for tobacco use. Coop, you're you're very well aware of this. This yep. is those. And so. This is something that we're going to continue to see with issues like this being at the forefront of some of the leaders that are now getting into office. Becerra being no exception to that. This is the platform that he chooses to st- one of the biggest platforms that he chooses to stand on. Um, and so I think that this is a really huge, uh, important uh, position. Now he's I, I haven't been able to find in my minimal research that I've done. I haven't been able to find anything where he is uh, sponsored. Um, you know, non-smoking acts or, um, or what his position on T21 was, for example. But let's not forget where he hails from, Coop, which is California. California right. has paved the way for anti-tobacco legislation for four decades. Um, and with their most recent bouts against flavored tobacco bans, uh, you know, um, outright banning uh, tobacco use in many cities, um, if not the entire state in a lot of places, I mean, you, there's, I mean, there's only a handful of places that, that are grandfathered in where you could actually enjoy a cigar, uh, inside the state of California. There just really isn't, there really isn't much, um, uh, much leeway there. So I think this is really, this is a really important decision and it, it should have caught the attention of, of everyone in the cigar uh, community because it's, it's, I mean, it's not frightening. I'm not terrified of Z- Xavier Becerra, but I'm, but it, it, it could it could post to be really challenging, and it's something we need to keep an eye on, and it's something that our uh, our legislators and everything need to get ahead of, and prepared to work with him, just like the way that we were prepared and excited to work with Tom Price, um, and some great victories came out of the last administration. We, uh, but uh, you know, there was a lot still left on the table, and it's only going to get harder from here. So, um, those are those are my thoughts. Yes, a few things on his background. Um, He is a former congressman. He's a lawyer. Um, He has a degree in economics where Dr. Tom Price was a physician. And uh, Alex Azar came from the pharmaceutical industry, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, So he is not he has he has been on subcommittees on health and Social Security. Um, He has, you know, there's some things about. Uh, the abortion bills where he, you know, I'm going to keep that aside, but really not the same. You, yeah, The one thing that I'm fearful of this is you have a someone who basically is a career politician. One reason why I think everyone got behind um, Dr. Gottlieb, who headed the FDA, was in his commitment to the science, right, and understanding the science behind everything. And I think, you know, I'm not saying he was a friend of the industry, Dr. Gottlieb, but the, the big question is who now goes in there? I mean, the, the President Biden, President Biden is still going to nominate the FDA commissioner, uh, but I'm sure it's going to be consulting with uh, Attorney General Becerra on this um, going in there. It, it's I, I just I really I'd like to see a little strategy around this. I'd like to see some awareness created here. Um he's going to have bigger fish to fry, no doubt about it, in the next couple of years. So I don't think this is, but we just, it's not, there's nothing positive about this, right? I'm yeah. not, well, his first and primary, 
his first and primary uh, goal will be to make sure that uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic is put to rest, making sure that the vaccine has been put out yeah. and that it is, it, it, that it works, right? And that, you know, yeah. everyone is healthy and everything. That's going to be, I would say that's going to be the primary focus for the first half of this, uh, of this, yeah. um, of this administration. Uh, and then probably also putting in a lot of effort to, uh, you know, putting in contingencies and backups uh, to, to prevent in, uh, any yeah. other additional uh, pandemics from occurring, um, you know, policies and things like that. I think that's going to be, that's going to eat up a lot of his time and priority, yep. especially with his background and in, in, in position on affordable health care. But like you said, it's, it's, it's troubling considering his background, um, where he hails from. And uh, I mean, you know, he's no, this, he's, he's not a friend of the tobacco industry. So we need to prepare to work with him and we need to be prepared to, to put in some challenging hours ahead because this is, this is not going to be easy. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, um, we haven't heard from Scott, uh, Scott Pierce on this yet. Uh, the PCA, uh, executive director, uh, obviously we we're still waiting to see what happens with CRA. It sounds like from your interview with, um, Alan Rubin, there's some things happening there. They are looking to kind mm-hmm. of put someone in there. So there's and, and PCA has their hands full with a lot of stuff right now getting through what if they don't have a trade show. So I, I get it, but I still think uh, you, you know, I, I think this is a great question, Bear, when you have Joshua Habarski on um, who's coming up now also for more takes. Um, because I think this yeah. is an a, important thing to talk about. Um and just create awareness. I'm not saying they have to make a judgment call, but hey, just so you know, uh, because again, you know, elect, I understand that elections are, are won and lost for the presidency on more important things than cigars. But you never know. You you never know. You know. So I I think it's it's something we need to keep an eye on and certainly create awareness for. And I know we'll be talking about this in upcoming uh, shows for sure. Hundred percent. Yep. Now, speaking of the PCA, um, this next topic, this kind of happened. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to. Yeah, so the, the other news that came out um, like about a week after um, a week after he uh, stepped down as executive director of Cigar Rights of America, Glenn Loop uh, has joined the PCA as an advisor. Which remember I was saying I thought that maybe a consultative role for Glenn Loop somehow in this. Mm-hmm. I wasn't surprised by it. I was surprised how quick it happened, and I was surprised it was the PCA. That surprised me. Um, I, I thought maybe there'd be some independent thing he would do, and it'd probably be still on the cigar rights piece, but he's moved over to PCA. And that's surprise. It's okay. That's surprising that he left and then has gone to the other organization. It, it just it was a it was a str- Now Glenn Loop's going to be focused, I think, more on the state issues right now, on the legislative end. He's going to be working, I guess, on Joshua's team, Joshua Horbarski's team, and. Look, there is there is a battle on the states that we'll get into. There's a lot of issues on the states front, and they did need someone to focus on that. Um, but I, as much as I wasn't surprised he was going to be an advisor or consultant or whatever you want to call it, I I was still surprised by this move. Um, I was surprised as, as well, Coop. I was also surprised with the speed. I was a week. Um, it was like a week. You know, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, you know, again, I, I've been on record for this and, 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 and Alan Rubin had gave a great, a great point, a uh, very transparent point on the show that I, inter- where I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago about how, why, how and why they haven't chosen a successor yet because they're able to run without, without direct for the time being. Right. You know, it's a position they're going to fill. Um, but they were able to continue to run it without uh, ne- that wasn't a necessity as, as they viewed it. So, um, you know, where they absolutely needed it to keep running, you know, to a certain extent. So that's uh, it was it was really transparent of, of Alan to 
to share that. And it actually was frankly the best answer that I've heard um, because, well, it's also one of the only answers that I've heard, but it was, it was definitely a really great explanation for it and gives me hope for what, uh, what the next leader of PCA will be. That being said, I was also disappointed that, you know, Glenn Loop found his next position before his, before his predecessor was even named um, <laughs> just because of how fast and quick it was. Yeah. Um, that all being said, uh, to kind of sum it up in a nutshell, I think it's really exciting for PCA to have someone with Glenn's experience. Yeah. Um, and I think this bodes well for the industry because, again, having him on the PCA team um, will be um, will be a force to reckon with, which is really terrific. And um, you know, Glenn has had experience working with. Uh, working with Democratic Congresses, working with Democratic administrations, he has had the the, the capability to maneuver uh, politically um, on both sides of the aisle, um, and uh, he's been an advocate for the industry. So I think this is a huge win for the PCA uh, to to get Glenn on board, and uh, I'm I'm excited about it. I am too. And and what I wanted to say too, and, and I I know I mentioned this when I was on Meet the Professor with Carlito and Jose and Jeremiah is the state, the states are going to have a states are really going to come into the crosshairs because what I think is going to happen is with everything going on with COVID and the, the money that's being spent right on, you know, dealing with this, that they're going to have to fund this. And I think you're going to start to see a lot of, tax increases and they're going to go right after cigars it's going to be in the cross and this is going to go right after cigars and i think come january 1st you're going to see all these things start to pop up right now um so to have glenn there because we'll talk about joshua a little more in a second joshua couldn't do it all he's doing the federal stuff too and I imagine mm -hmm. I, I don't see Glenn excluded from the federal piece with his experience. I don't see that. Like you, you just nailed No, it. not at all. So I think it's a good thing for the industry that Glenn has found a role here. Maybe it was time for a new voice at CRA. We've said that. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk to Glenn specifically on this topic. I know we're overdue to have him for he's already offered to come back on the show, by the way. So we have to, and I think, yeah, so, so yeah, he, he reminded me, him and Josh, uh, and I know Josh is doing your show, uh, which is very mm -hmm. exciting. So, you know, I think it's, a, I think this was a Bre yes. breaking news there, Coop. Appreciate that. Sorry. I leaked it. I leaked it. <laughs> I didn't say one, I, but uh, sorry, but I think it's important uh, for have to have Glenn uh, rather than hire someone completely new to this. Uh, there's a lot of new blood in the PCA too. Um, and like I said, I think Glenn wants to be a part of this industry and wants to be a part of this fight. So I'm, I'm really happy for him. I hope this is you know, what he wanted and everything. Um, it, it's still a little bit of a perplexing move, I think. But I, in the end, I think there's nothing more to positives I could say on that. Oh, 100 percent. Right. 100 percent. Now, yeah. On that point, um. Joshua Habarski was a recipient of a pretty nice award there this week. This yes. Week. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little about that? Um, well, you know, it was really, it was really, it was really great to see someone from our industry um, be recognized uh, at such a, um, we'll say secular level. You know, we were talking uh, with our guests, uh, we were talking about our guests a few minutes ago about like who would be person of the year in the cigar industry and they gave some you know pretty fantastic answers absolutely um but uh what, what's really great is that you know when you're recognized for your peers outside of what you do i mean that's you know that's pretty that's pretty awesome um and so you know there uh i want to make sure I, that i get the uh the name of the award and recognition correct so give me a moment to pull that up but joshua habarski was actually named uh for the two 2020 uh head of government affairs, top lobbyist. So, you know, this is a, this is a really big deal. The Hills 2020 top lobbyist list. I mean, there is some pretty, um, pretty heavy hitters on this list. Um, and, you know, 
when you think about how, you know, less than one half of 1% of all tobacco users are premium tobacco users, the small piece of the pie that Joshua represents, represents us well, for him to be named a top lobbyist, I mean, these are, think about all the lobbies that are represented in government, right? I mean, there are lobbyists for everything. We think about the big ones, right? We think about, you know, we think about gun advocacy. We think about oil. We think about, you know, big tobacco. We think about all these different lobbies, right? These are the big ones, the ones that we think about. But I mean, there are lobbies for everything. And for our industry to be represented by someone who is named a top lobbyist for 2020, I mean, that is, I mean, that's something, that's something we should all be proud of. Absolutely, and it was the hill. It was the hill. The hill. The online publication that gave him that that honor there. Um, and uh, there's a list of people. You know, I mean, I'll just, I'll just. The names aren't important, but I'll name people from companies: FedEx, Johnson and Johnson, Allstate, TikTok, Google, Hewlett Packard, General Electric, uh, Merck, right? Um, and there you have Joshua comes on there, right? who in my opinion he uh he had to do a a really you know under very difficult circumstances this year with the pca to get acknowledged right i'm sure the hill probably doesn't know the inner the inner uh the inner um the inner workings there so um that's you know he was shorthanded a lot of his staff was furloughed. He had a come, he was one of the first guys to come back from furlough, um, and I'm sure he's interacted with a lot of the stuff also on the judicial front. So I'm sure he's been working with the legal team and stuff on that as well. So I, I think it was a great a great uh, a great honor. And and I also want to mention there were other association people, you know, from associations. I mentioned the, some of the secular pieces, but you know, there's there's people from. Uh, the Consumer Data Industry Association, uh, the Real Estate Roundtable, U.S. Travel Association, Aerospace Industries Association, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic uh, Committees. There were people from those, American Dental Association. So there are a lot of other associations, but again, our, ours is probably pal- pales into comparison of all, of all those. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's a big congratulations to him. I think it's uh, anytime our industry is going to be recognized at that level um, in mainstream, uh, it's a great, it's a great thing. We've never had someone like that before. Get that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, kudos to them. Uh, well, well deserved. Uh, I've not really had a chance to talk to Joshua. I've emailed with him a few times, but he seems like a really good guy. So uh, I'm very, very excited and, and proud that he got that. So uh, we should be commending them. Uh, and, and absolutely. They put a press release out there and it went out there uh, for, for, for the, uh, for everyone to see, I, I think it was a great thing, and we're gonna have a challenging year ahead in 2021, no question about that. Yes, definitely for sure. So, if it, I mean, challenge challenge is forthcoming. If he could get on that list uh, two years in a row, we know that we're uh, we're doing some good things uh, in the industry, which is great. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, one last topic, and this is not related to legislation or. Uh, anything uh, around that um so we're we t- we're getting into the beginnings of um cigar of the year um the coop list is already going cigar journal just completed their list so you know things are happening i think i think i mentioned on kma a lot of the lists have been i think delayed this year <coughs> excuse me because of um because of a lot of the releases came out very late this year so i think mm-hmm. um it didn't affect the coop list as much because of the way i do it uh but but it's had an impact and there there there's a lot of different ways that cigar of the year is done right and Aaron and I have talked a lot about this, but I don't know if we've talked about it here. You know, there's, there's the subjective way of doing this, right? Like the way we kind of do it is we, people want to know our opinion of the cigar of the year based on a set of criteria. And we come up with a list. And that list is certainly open to debate, you know, in doing that, right? 
Um, I've seen some retailers get involved with this and they tend to focus on sales, right? Which is another component. I don't believe in, um, I don't believe in sales as a, you know, I always say like the, the highest grossing movie doesn't necessarily win the Oscar for Academy Award, right? So I've kind of always not been a fan of that, right? Right. But there's another way that I've seen it done. And it's the it's the crowdsourcing way of doing it. Like, hey, instead of um, instead of someone like like let the people decide it, right? Let the people. What's the people's um the decision on that? So there was a bit of a controversy this past weekend, um, and it's from uh, I know him better than you, so I could talk. It's uh the, our friends at Smoking Tobacco. Uh, Matt Tobacco, uh, his uh, significant other, Nicole, uh, they've formed a website. I've been talking. I talked a little about them. Jose's going to be on the show. Um, and they've kind of taken I've, – I've been paying attention to them as of late. John Carney's a part of the show, and I'll talk about the Carney connection in a bit, right? Um, but they have kind of – they have really taken – I think what they've done a little differently, maybe not unique, but they have definitely really encouraged and fostered community – um and you know getting their audience involved in what they do with the show a little different than maybe dojo does it and the old what scar federation has done but they they've they've really done um a good a good job i think at that i can learn i i don't think i do a good job with that okay in 10 years okay it's not easy to do right um and i but i think they've built their brand on that and it's a growing brand they're a new brand they have a podcast um, which I encourage smoking tobacco, uh, dot com. Check them out. Good people. Just want to be got, clear. You, you don't think you're good at what? I'm sorry. I just want to be I'm clear. Not, on I'm not you... good at fostering the community piece. I, I can interact, but as far as bringing it's, it's organizing it, it's tough. I'm just not, I, I, I could, I couldn't disagree more. Coop. I think you have one of the strongest communities out there. Yeah. I'm biased cause I work with you, but, but have I done a good job at integrating it in with the brand? Maybe I need to do a better job with that. Well, I, I think that there's different perceptions on that. There's different styles and different ways of doing it. It doesn't mean that the fostering the community is lacking, though. Okay, that's so, a fair. I, that's I, don't fair. To, I, don't, I don't mean to digress. I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, to digress. No, 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 I that. understand what you're saying. But I've been impressed with what they've done in a short amount of time. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm not trying to yeah. take away from yeah. them either. Just... I've gotten, a, you know, I'm always a little hesitant when I, when I see a new media brand. Uh, but I think it's important when I start to see them doing a lot of the right things um, with it. And they brought John Carney in kind of as a – Carney does the show, but it's, he does not promote the Florida Dominicana on that show at all. Um, so he's on there, and that's why every guest they've had on, you know, no one's had a problem with John being on the show because John's been taking a very objective approach uh, with that. It's, it was the same way when I had Nick Sirius at Smooth Drawers. Nick never wanted to talk about L.A. cigars, right? Um which was, uh, you know, we always had to tell him, Nick, you should talk about your brand ones. He didn't want to do that. And I think John's doing the same thing. So I, I actually have gotten to know Matt and Nicole uh, much more. I, you know, I'm getting to know them better. Uh, I'm impressed with them as, as not just uh, a media brand, but as people. I, I mean, and, uh, you know, I know you haven't really met them yet. I'd encourage it uh, because I think they're just good people. And they decided to do a Cigar of the Year contest. And in the Cigar of the Year contest, they, um, they decided to put it out to, a, to the people um, and, and decide, you know, who, who, uh, which should be their best Cigar of the Year. Um, and I was really, you know, and here's the thing that, like, they may not have known, right? We've seen this crowdsourcing thing before in, in, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing them on this, right? But for folks who've been doing this for a few years, we've seen this crowdsource approach, right? To Cigar of the Year. Mm -hmm. What happens, like what- On the, very, very, very famous publications. So we're not even talking about- Right, right. Like, we're to, like we've seen it with tobacco business. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we've seen this, okay? And typically the cigar that wins, is who gets behind the cigar the the, the fastest, right? Sure. Who gets who gets behind the cigar? Come out and like we see it every year with Tobacco Business and Cigar Journal. It's really the, if you're gonna win that, you have to get people to you have to get people to the polls, and you have to get people to vote. 
So, so it's about the community piece that you were talking about a second ago, because there's that tie-in. Right. It's a very it's a key piece, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, and I, I'm gonna kind of so they picked. I have the list here because I wrote this down. Um, they picked seven cigars, and the cigars they picked, I'm not crit- I'm not gonna criticize them for. They had they they basically picked brands I think that they showcased on the show, on their show. Okay. You know, cigars they enjoy, and, which is fair. It's they have a right to do it that way, right? It's their brand, all right, and they've built a community. So why not have the uh, the brand that they've been highlighting in their community? To be the uh, cigar of the year. Now, here, here are the here are the cigars they picked. And again, I'm not judging them. In fact, I've had all but one of them. Uh, they had the La Florida Minicana 25th anniversary, right? Which Carney didn't even know they were picking, just so you know. Uh, and you know, mm-hmm. for you, Carney hasn't been pushing it, right? Because he he was a little concerned about conflict of interest, right? Uh, the Agonorsa Leaf Supreme Leaf, the HVC Hot Cake, the Perdomo 10th anniversary Sun Grown, the McAuliffe A. And the brand called the uh, from a company called Nova Cigars called Platinum Batch. Those were the seven things they picked, and they basically okay. uh, set up a poll. And I, the way the poll worked is you could vote once a day, right? You could vote once a day, which I you know like way if you do it that way, what better way to get your community behind it, right? Mm-hmm. So what happened is early on is. Two communities really got behind this thing. It was the McAuliffe and the Nova, the Platinum Batch Nova. They had the most people coming out to vote, and they were in a dogfight for about a week where these two just started running away from the pack. Perdomo was like third. Perdomo had a little bit of a boost, but they were still, Perdomo was actually third in this, right? So McAuliffe and, and, and Platinum Batch, they were going back and forth. The numbers are going up and up. Then something happened. Over the weekend, there was like a slew of votes that came in to the Nova cigar. Like a thousand votes. Like it was a it was a crazy number. There was it was more votes than it and it came in overnight, right? And it raised the Yeah, it wasn't of, over a weekend, it was overnight. It was like nine hundred percent increase overnight. Right. right. And right. Suddenly, people started getting very upset. They started blaming Matt and Nicole for this. Like, um, and I'll, I'll just—I think that Nova is a sponsor of theirs. To be fair, and and look, we have sponsored cigars <coughs> on our list, so that's part of the game. Um, they had to make a very tough decision. Um, they couldn't get the raw data to kind of validate everything from the polling thing they used, and they had a can. Unfortunately, they had to cancel this contest which i think they did the right by the way they handled this professionally they went and did a couple of videos addressing the situation head on i think they were very sincere about it. i don't think there was anything more than they were trying to put something out there but when something like that happens and the other thing they were very clear on is they they've talked to i guess they don't feel anyone from the companies did anything dirty yes the companies were promoting them when they were in that cat fight but they don't think that they, they don't know how this happened, unfortunately. And they had, unfortunately, they had to cancel this, right? So I kind of feel really bad for them, first of all, because I think they were, like I said, I've gotten to know them. I think they did things the right way. But it kind of brings back the question there, and I'll get you some of your thoughts on that. Is there any way you could do a, uh, truly do a crowdsourcing cigar of the year? I mean, is there any way that this can be done? Because I just, I kind of really started to question that myself. Is it, I don't know if there's ever a way you're going to be able to do it. Not objectively. Because, I mean, the most objective way to put out a, a crowdsource poll, right, is, hey, submit your nominees for the Cigar of the Year. And then by the time you're done with that, depending on how far your reach is, your data is so scattered. And the cigar that wins Cigar of the Year could be something like I'm not even being obnoxious here. Could have something like five votes, right? You know, right? I mean, if you if you just I mean, but that is truly the only objective way to crowdsource a number one cigar of the year. You know, this is this was not an objective poll; it was a subjective poll. And I'm not knocking it, like you said, Coop. I think right. you I think you put a good point out there that these are, these are cigar companies that they had relationships with and featured on their show. And why not, why not nominate from the, from that pool? That's, I think that's, 
I don't I, think I, there's I, anything wrong with that at no, all. I don't think there's anything um, wrong with it either. And, and like I said, I don't, you know, it's unfortunate that, I mean, there are ways you, I thought about maybe you make a very tight registration system with a short window, but then it, I don't know, does it start to take away from the commu- community aspect? You know, the McCall people are really kind of getting behind this contest too. Oh, uh, they have a really well, good they're, cigar. They're really, they really, I was going to say, yeah, they have a really good cigar and they have a really great, they have a really great, uh, they, they're really good at uh, sparking a catalyst with their community. I mean, yeah. we've talked about that yeah. uh, several times. Um, they're really, they have a really vibrant community and they're very active and it's, I'm surprised the, uh, you know, when I saw some of the initial numbers, you know, the Perdomo army always comes out too. And I'm surprised yeah. that that was so low. I was surprised uh, too. Yeah, I was surprised too. I mean, and that cigar is a very good cigar, the, the Sun Grown. They have the 10th mm-hmm. anniversary. Um, and they have a very, very, very passionate ba- fan base and community as well. Right. So that was that was interesting to me. Um, so to, to go back to your question, Coop, I, I don't think I don't think there is a I don't think there's an objective way that you can crowdsource a cigar because I, the I, only objective option is to put it out there, say, OK, nominate your cigar of the year. And then you're going to end you're going to end up with just a, a shotgun blast of choices that your winner is going to have like five votes. You and know, that's not really. Yeah. Or if you kind of did it the way they did it. OK, it doesn't. It, and this is again, I'm not I want to be careful what I say here. You could put seven brand. You're putting seven brands out there. And in the bottom line, if people are getting behind the brand. Yeah. So it, well, then also, what's the criteria, though? But, it, you know, we uh, we discern that it was because of relationships being built or the or the feature the, them being featured on the show but was that the reason they were nominated you know i, I think they felt they were good cigars and i got because they had other people on the shows too that, that, that didn't have cigars nominated so okay That's you fair. know you know they could have easily so i think they felt they were and they were you know they i was before the thousand votes came in i was talking to them a lot i had not smoked the nova cigars before um so i, I was really curious about it because obviously they felt it was a very good cigar um so, you know, and it was a way they were, you know, they were honest. They were, they were honest about it. Hey, we did this to promote our brand and kind of foster in that community piece. Um, Sounds great. It, it is unfortunate that this happened is, is all I got to say. Because, oh, yeah. And, 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 I, and I say anyone who kind of blames them for this is, is, is so wrong. Um, like I said, I think ultimately it's a model that's very difficult to, to, to implement. Um, you know, we've, we've seen this happen. Like I said, I think the two that come to mind are Cigar Journal and um, Tobacco Business. Right. right, right, right. Those are crowdsourced. The crowd, um, the crowdsourced. I don't, and the, the votes are the nominations are crowdsourced. The votes, I believe, I don't know if the, I don't know how they do the votes because I don't think they try to give like, the same category to everybody. Well, my problem with the tobacco business awards is the fact that there's so many inaccuracies each and every year that it's just it's just mind numbing. But yeah, that's I think that's another cup of coffee and another subject all entirely. Um, but I, yeah, it, it it really is unfortunate that they had to take it down. I think I think if you're sitting here thinking, you know, you know, pointing the finger at them or laughing at them or blaming them, I mean, I think that's I think that's incredibly short sighted because you know, they wanted to, they wanted to bring some excitement to, to their brand. They wanted to, they wanted to engage with their community and have them participate. It was supposed to be fun. And, and obviously some person or some group of people uh, took it a little, you know, took it too seriously and decided to be obnoxious with it and rig it. And I mean, I think that's very evident. I don't think that this is, I don't think I'm overstating that. Right. I mean, you can't have that influx of votes overnight um, when it had been, you know, had been walking, <laughs> you know, had been tracking at a certain pace. It just doesn't happen. Again, I mean, not a thousand votes over uh, over one night. You know, I mean, what? Well, yeah, it, it's you know, and they. I mean, how big is their community in general? Because how big is their community in general? Like. If their community is less than a thousand people, they got more than that. They got, a, they got, a, they got. I want to say between two and three thousand in their in their group. Okay. Um. So up until that point, that one, you know, a third, a third of their entire community <laughs> hadn't voted yet. Right. And if you're only allowed to vote once a day, it, it just doesn't add up. So it, it's unfortunate. Someone, someone took advantage of some kind of system, rigged it, figured it out, you know, and um, and you know. 
the people who suffer are, are you know are Matt and Nicole and and the community, the people who did want to have fun with it, right? Yeah. Some you know some schmuck or some group of schmucks just decided to you know to take it a little too seriously, go over the top with it, and try to rig it, and that's yeah, that's not fun for anybody. And I'll say a few but things. All, yeah, yeah. I'll say a few other things. Is one, they never accused anyone. They didn't, they didn't make any accusations. They, they obviously something happened that they had to pull this down. They saw something that happened, right? But there was never an accusation leveled at them, uh, at anyone by them. And even the McAuliffe people, who were the second place people, most of the McAuliffe community, I think, has gotten to know them. They, most of them, were like, it ain't these, it ain't their fault. But there were a few people that were. They got some pretty. I mean, I could tell when they did a couple of those uh, videos. They were pretty. They were pretty shaken up by it, um, and I hated to see that. Um, and I think, like I said, you know, everyone has. I I've really gotten. I'm really. I, I like what they're doing. Um, I think they can learn from you, you. Learn. Look, we've all made. I I've made tons of mistakes over the years, right? I mean, I mean, the biggest mistake I made was remember a few years ago I misreported the FDA judge's decision. I mean, it doesn't get worse than that, right? Um, but you have to adjust and learn, and I think they will. Um, I think they were very transparent about that. And I think that's, you know, media is not perfect, is what I'm going to say. Um, but I don't think these are the bad guys of media by any means. Uh, they, they probably, like I said, some of us who have been doing this for a while, we've seen what could happen, you know, in terms of how these votes go. But I don't think anyone expected something like that that to happen yet we're not surprised these are there's always ways you can kind of go in the back door with this stuff do you remember do you remember the old cigar federation march madness yeah of course okay do you remember um there was a brand called bodega cigar blends you remember that yeah of course there was one year in the march madness that bodega cigar blends won the march madness right and was like destroying the competition. Like, and I think in the finals, they, they had Opus X and they like destroyed Opus X like 85% to like 15%. And right then and there, you know something's up because I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I don't care. Most people probably hadn't heard of Bodega. Uh, so there was definitely something up, whether they were really mobilizing. I'm not saying they were cheating, but that's kind of weird. You know, it kind of showed that that year Bodega had had a pretty good plan to kind of win this thing. Um, I think Fred won it a couple of times and Fred kind of Fred always promoted it. You know, and Fred had a huge social media following. So I wasn't surprised when, when Nomad won it a few years ago. Uh, I remember he beat Jose Blanco in the finals, I think. And Fred was like, I don't want to beat Jose Blanco. You know, I don't want to. I'm happy to be here, you know. But, you know, a lot of people. Fred had an incredible following on social media. So that's how these things tend to go. Um, it was an interesting exercise. Well, here's what I came out of this. If there's a positive, Nova's got, Nova was doing well against McAuliffe, right? They were holding their own against McAuliffe before the thousand came in. So they might have, there's something with that cigar that people are getting behind is what I'm saying. Yeah. So I, I think if anything from their exercise, what they did is they showed something where there's people passionate about a brand here. Um, and even though fortunately they couldn't, and it was the right thing not to award a cigar of the year. And this guy, I think they handled that the right way. Um, I mm -hmm. still would like to see them vote on it, but I don't think, you know, them personally, Matt and Nicole pick it, but I can understand why they won't at this point either. You know, it would just, they, they won't have anything. It's a game. shame. It's a shame. So, uh, so yeah, I want to just kind of tie up the show with that. Um, and uh, give those guys a listen to. They're pretty good. I'm, I'm, and they're getting better and better. You know, uh, that's what's great about the good content and stuff like that. Awesome. All right. I think we're getting to the tail end of this thing here. Um, let me just mention a couple of things, uh, housekeeping things on Coop. Um, the contest for the uh, J.C. Newman Ultimate Giveaway I will be picking the winners probably on Friday. That will not be a live drawing. I think it's a good idea to keep that stuff off of Facebook and, and the social media. So I'm going to do the drawing offline. Um, I'll use the same method, the wheel, but um, I think it will be better to do it that way. It's just the reality of, um, you know, we, we are giving you know, cigars away and stuff like that. So I think that's the right thing to do there. Um, sure. We have two more shows to finish up 
2020 on the Primetime Network. Um, Thursday, Aaron and I are going to welcome Omar Fernandez of AJ Fernandez Cigars. No relation between the two. Uh, other than Omar works for AJ Fernandez. He is the director of operations. Uh, I've gotten to know Omar over the last year. Uh, he's a really good guy, really smart guy. I think he'll have a lot of great insights. So I think you're going to want to tune into that. It's the first time we've had AJ Fernandez cigars on a primetime show. So, and, I, and Omar is also a former minor league baseball player. So we're going to be talking some baseball with him. And then. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. Yep. And so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, he played in the Dodgers organization. So, uh, I, um, and then on Monday, we will have the last primetime uh, jukebox on the 21st for the year. Uh, Dave Burke and I, it's been a, it's kind of a little bit of a somber theme, but we're going to put the positive spin on it. If, if you follow the music business, this has been a, a catastrophic year of people we've lost. Um, some big names uh, have really left us this year. Um, mm -hmm. and we're going to celebrate the life of the accomplishments of these people. Um, so awesome. we're going to put the positive spin on that and that will bring us to 2021 where the next special edition will be on January 5th, Tuesday. And that's going to be the big cigar aficionado rescheduled show. And that one will happen because we know, we know now when the schedule is so. Uh, that will be so. This is the last special edition for 2020. Really excited for that show. It's always fun each year. Hardest really excited year, to hardest go through year ever. Yeah, hardest year ever. Really, yeah, really hard. Yeah, really hard. So, so yeah, we got we got some, and then uh, we have some. We have most of January booked already. I think for both for all the shows, uh, we actually have one opening. We, we are talking with someone still. So, um, but that's that's yeah, that's that now. Bear has got a big milestone coming up on Sunday. Um, hey, and the milestone is your 150th take. Yeah, our, our 150th take. We're, uh, I, you know, I can't believe it, Coop. You know, like 149 takes ago, you know, I, I ran this idea by you and you've been supportive of me from day one. And uh, it all started with uh, Tim Wong at La Zona Palooza for take number one. And, uh, you know, three years and one month later, here I am 150 takes in. And uh, so my 150th take will be this Sunday. And I'm so excited, so pleased, so proud, uh, so privileged to welcome uh, the incomparable Nick Perdomo to sit down for my 150th take. That's a big accomplishment there. Uh, congrats. I mean, what we've had, you've had a great lineup of shows and, and the guests have been, you've had all the major players you're getting on now. So um, congratulations on that. Uh, that's going to be a fantastic show with Nick. Uh, Nick's always great. There's always something to talk about with Nick. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So that's exciting, exciting news. Congratulations on 150. Um, and then next year you'll be hitting that 200, like all of our shows will be hitting the 200. Well, special edition will be hitting 100, but, uh, primetime will be hitting 200, probably, uh, middle of next year too. So right around our four year mark. So big, big milestones coming up in 2021 with these, with these programs. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then of course, uh, 2000, that will be the last show of 2020 will be this Sunday. Um, taking the last Sunday off, uh, to spend with family. Uh, just after Christmas. And then uh, to kick off 2021 will be on the third uh, will be uh, my top 10 cigars of 2020. Yep. And then the Coop cigar, number one cigar, we announced the day after we do the aficionado show. So it's going to be that first week in January. We're getting off to a flying start is what I'll say. So, uh, so the cigar aficionado shows on a Monday or are we doing it on Tuesday, the fifth, it's Tuesday, the fifth, my number one cigar is okay. on the fourth. My number one cigar is on the fourth. Okay. So, I think there's some confusion earlier, so I just wanted to clarify that. I may have confused it, so I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's it's the first Tuesday of January. We're gonna be doing the fish and show because yeah. the list comes out the week so the after. Third, fourth, and the fifth. Exciting. We're gonna be talking about lists. Yep. Our favorite. The thing that no one pays attention to, by the way. <laughs> yeah. All right, and then one last thing because it, it's been coming up in the chat all night. Bear, you have a big weekend coming up. Uh, 
So you're gonna be, we're gonna be watching a, we're gonna have a little watch party, and we're gonna uh, be watching an absolute epic film, uh, American. I don't know what you're talking about. Kirby. I don't have a big weekend. There's nothing. I'm not gonna be doing anything special at all. You're gonna be watching Christmas Vacation with with mm-hmm. all your friends, uh, and um, we're gonna see one of the uh, you know legendary Hollywood actor Chevy Chase, um, in there, um. And uh, I, you know, and uh, it's all going to be for a good cause, though. So that's that's the important thing. So, yes, yes, it is going to be for a good cause. Um, you know, I was really excited. Uh, you know, last last week we, uh, you know, I answered the, you know, two weeks ago I answered the challenge, and uh, about being on this, you know, being on this. Uh, group uh, to watch this uh, atrocious example of a film with uh, one of the world's most talentless actors ever to to grace the silver screen and Chevy Chase but uh, but uh, here I am nonetheless doing it Um, what I am really excited about um, I just I cannot thank Joe Grow enough uh, for putting this event together sincerely and I mean that um, because what we are doing um, is, and everybody that's that's participating in the event, it was asked to, uh, um, it was required, it was asked to to donate twenty five dollars for a seat to sit and watch this dumpster fire of a film with me. Um, but I'm so excited um, what Joe was able to put together. Um, we're going to be raising some money for charity that night. Uh, cause I'm really excited about bringing some attention to uh, canines for warriors um, which trains and provides service dogs to veterans with ptsd brain injury and survivors of sexual assault Um, so it's it's a very personal charity for me for a number of reasons my father's a veteran Um, he suffers uh, from ptsd uh, suffers from a number of injuries which has caused early onset dementia and um and uh, I love dogs, and I, I lost I my I I lost my dog earlier this year, um, and um, it's it's a wonderful organization, and so we're gonna be raising some great money for some a great organization that's gonna do a world of good for the people who serve our country, um, and give all of their, you know give all of themselves to our country and to our, to serve this, uh, to the service country that we call home. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that part. And I can't thank Joe enough for that. So this, uh, this is an incredible opportunity. Um, I'm going to absolutely blast the film the entire time there. I warned everybody, it will not be enjoyable for you all. It won't be enjoyable for me. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, we're doing it for a great cause. And that's something to that's something to celebrate. No, that's all good. And we're like I said, everyone I think will have respect. Uh, we can we can we can it won't get personal. So I think it's all going to be everyone's going to have good fun with it. So it's not personal. It's only personal for if your name is Chevy Chase. So and Chevy Chase won't be on the call unless Joe's just got some enormous like reach that I just am not aware of. No, no, uh, I know which... it's limited. Hey, <laughs> if people are interested. You got to contact Joe Grow. He's organizing it. So um, he's got all yeah. the information. Uh, Check out my Facebook page. There's a post on it. Um, and, and, and guys, if you can't get a seat on Saturday, sincerely, take a look at caninesforwarriors.org. Yeah. Uh, and uh, consider making a donation. I made my donation already. Uh, so it's in there. Thanks, Coop. No, no problem. It's a great cause um, as well. Um, so um, I absolutely support the charity. I support the cause. And I'm looking forward to having a lot of fun. We're going to be recording Jukebox um, on saturday but we should be i should be done and maybe i'll miss the first few minutes of that but that's gonna be a longer it's gonna imagine that's gonna take a long time to go through that film so we're probably gonna be up late on that one (laughs) yeah all right Uh, i want to thank our audience uh again a great audience we've had um i want to thank again carlito and jose um by the way jose just messaged me realized we were still on the air and um that's going to be a take a take no it's that's your word that's gonna be a wrap uh this is prim- <laughs> a wrap on uh the 2020 season of primetime special edition it's now in the annals of history for this wednesday 
December, oh, sorry, Tuesday, December 15th, now Wednesday, December 16th in the Eastern and Central time zones. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be, uh, stay tuned. More shows coming up, and then we'll see you on the next Tuesday on January 5th. Have a super fantastic uh, night, everybody. See you next time.